Good afternoon and welcome to the first day of a two-day public workshop on establishing a high-quality real-world data ecosystem. Um, my name is Marta Voshinska and I'm the Deputy Director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. We are convening this workshop under a cooperative agreement with the US FDA. It is a two-day workshop, so tomorrow we will pick up again at 1 p.m. Eastern time. This uh, workshop comes at a critical junction. Um, as part of implementation efforts of the 21st Century Cures Act, the FDA has chartered a vision and outlined key considerations for utilizing real-world data and evidence for medical product decision-making. Utilizing RWE starts with uh, fit for purpose data that are characterized as reliable, relevant, and with high quality. The Duke Margolis Center, along with other partners, have explored these data characterization issues in past discussions, which have contributed to growing stakeholder awareness of the need to improve data capture at the point of care. Improving data collection and overall quality of this information will require building an ecosystem of normative practices around tools, standards, and workflows. The scalability of this ecosystem will largely depend on developing a shared vision and culture around the value of high quality data. While the FDA values reliable and relevant evidence for regulatory decision making, a clear value proposition must be communicated to show how the availability of high quality data can meet the needs of other stakeholders as well. The reason we're virtually convening this workshop, um, I think only reinforces the need to capture high quality data that can support a range of evidence needs. Uh, we will hear uh, more about the data and evidence needs being developed as part of the COVID-19 response efforts from the FDA's Principal Deputy Commissioner, um, Amy Abernathy. Uh, she will speak later in the day. Now, before we get started, I wanted to cover some virtual workshop logistics. To the fan. So during today's virtual workshop, we will invite groups of speakers to provide remarks and engage in discussions in each session. Additionally, at the end of each session, we will have time to address any submitted questions. To submit a question, please email margolisevents at duke.edu and we will address questions if time allows. A recording of this workshop will also be made available on the Duke Margolis website following the event. And because we're recording, we want to remind our speakers to please check that your camera and microphone are active before speaking. If you do encounter any difficulty activating your microphone before speaking, our production partner may remotely activate and deactivate your microphone on your behalf. Not your camera, but your microphone. Um, we have developed an annotated agenda that has additional background on today's discussion topics that you can review on our page, uh, event page as well. And uh, we encourage you to engage and react on Twitter regarding today's workshop with a hashtag RWD ecosystem. And you may also consider mentioning our account at Duke Margolis. Uh, we invite you to follow the Duke Margolis Twitter account and uh, join the conversation online. So, Let's uh, now talk about the overview, the, our agenda. As I mentioned, uh, this is a two-day workshop. We will begin uh, today with an introduction from Jacqueline corrigan Corey, a director of the Office of Medical Policy at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA, as well as Leslie Curtis, professor and chair, Department of Population Health Services at Duke University. In addition to her presentation during the introduction, it is our pleasure to have Leslie also serve as our moderator for today's workshop, which will entail the first two sessions on the agenda. Session one, identifying data capture challenges and understanding stakeholder needs. And session two, emerging insights and lessons learned from initiatives to optimize data capture at the point of care. We will have a short 10 minute break between sessions one and two uh, at approximately 2, 10 p.m. Finally, we're privileged to have Amy Abernathy Principal Deputy Commissioner for Food and Drugs at the USMDA, who will provide a featured presentation on development of this COVID-19 Evidence Accelerator Initiative. And uh, we will conclude at 4 p.m. today and then resume the workshop tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. 
So um, if I would, I would like to um, turn uh, to uh, Jacqueline Corrigan Gray and uh, Leslie Curtis to kick us off with keynote remarks. Great, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us virtually for what I know will not only be an informative discussion, but will also lead to some actionable next steps. I wanna thank all the speakers and panelists for taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules and to make made all the more challenging, as we know, in the face of COVID-19. I wanna thank the staff from Duke for all the work they've done to bring us together today and also to my colleagues at FDA, in particular, uh, Deanne Perowin. As we think about generating RWE, it's exciting to think about the questions we might answer faster and more efficiently. But as we also think about RWE, it's, we know that we can't build quality RWE without foundational quality data. For years, we have used claims data to answer safety questions. Such data has been very informative for certain endpoints and questions, and, and it has the advantage of being highly structured. However, as we move forward to try to answer additional questions, we need to expand our data sources. In our framework, the RWE framework for our program, we discuss the importance of first and foremost determining whether data are fit for use. And in particular, we talk about data relevance and reliability, which we further defined as data cruel and data quality control. We indicated that reliability assessments consider whether codes or combination of codes in these data really adequately represent the underlying medical con concepts that they're intended to represent so that we can have confidence as we're looking at that data and the evidence that's derived from there. And the relevance is considering whether the data really adequately capture all the information on exposure and outcomes and covariates that we need. About a year ago, Duke also published a white paper outlining their framework for assessing whether real world data are fit for regulatory decisions. Much of the focus of that paper expanded on the important concepts of data accrual and data quality control. Data quality control defined as uh, the steps taken during curation of the real world data to ensure that the data met pre-specified standards and are reproducible. And quality insurance were proactive and retrospective steps to evaluate whether pre-specified requirements were filled. For example, something, an, an entry that was supposed to be in age that it was all done in the numerical values. These processes are incredibly important considerations when we evaluate real world data for regulatory use and certainly should inform our discussions today. We also want to think more broadly about how to create a data ecosystem in which these quality control processes are built in the system earlier. By doing so, we can have more confidence that the data we are extracting from these sources represent the underlying medical concepts of interest with less variability than would exist and when harmonizing those concepts across systems. As we think about questions that can be answered with RWD, we often reach a point where we think, if only, if only that one element was captured more reliably and consistently, or in a manner that was more easily curated across systems, the question might be more feasible to address. For example, let's say you're thinking about a trial in heart failure and you want to focus just on the preserved ejection fraction population. It's not clear we're always going to capture that very reliably in ICD-10 code, and we want to really know how that assessment was made. More often or not, that information is in the medical records. It's just rarely in a single structured fail field across one system, much less two or more. And the same can be said about many pieces of key clinical data that are collected, but are recorded much in the same way as they were in paper records, only now digitally. And we've seen some great work in taking these data and through highly involved curation strategies, assembling the data into a reliable clinical data set. And while this approach has been quite valuable and enables more use of the data, especially and often in retrospective studies when there's sufficient time to accomplish that curation, when we think about having data that's useful and fit for use to incorporate more in real time settings, for example, in randomized trials, better data capture at the source may be key. You know, in many meetings such as this, the conversations that occur around RWD data quality are conversations between sponsors, investigators, data companies, and regulators. But of course, we all know that real world data is generated not for research, but for clinical care and administrative purposes, such as billing. 
And if we want to think about how we move the ball in the RWD ecosystem forward, we need to think about where value is added for all stakeholders, including our patients. And the problem, of course, is not easy to do, right? As regulators, many of the data points needed to inform regulatory questions will be captured in EHRs, but we may also need linkage to claims and other sources to verify and gather a complete picture. And while few clinicians would probably vote for paper records again, they are certainly not clamoring to enter more data into their EHRs or other systems. Indeed, we see the rise of medical scribes to actually free practitioners from their EHRs and likely with the continued individualized data entry approaches. However, there are advantages for clinicians, researchers, and payers to have an improved data ecosystem. For example, earlier this year, there was a study published by Mark Overhedge and David McCallie looking at the active time in the EHR for 155,000 physicians across 400 health systems and 100 million patient encounters. And they found on average, clinicians spent just over 16 minutes per encounter in the EHR with considerable variation by specialty. And about a third of that time was reviewing the chart, a quarter on documentation and ordering was another one fifth. And in the accompanying editorial by Julia Milston, she noticed chart review stands out as an activity most in need of optimization, but with the fewest tools available. And talked about how investments in visualization tools and predictive models or artificial intelligence enabled tools aim to help identify the really critical problems that could otherwise be missed but don't always target in the outpatient setting and address common pain points like information synthesis. So for clinicians, finding the information easily and it being in the right information and not the incorrect entry that gets carried forward by cutting and pasting is just as important to quality as care as it is to research. Recently, the Annals of Internal Medicine issued a supplement on implementing and reporting health system improvements in the era of electronic health records. The papers in that supplement discuss EHRs for observational studies, randomized trials, safety and quality improvement, and clinical decision support. These articles were more focused on practice improvement, but again, there are just common needs that we need to find the common ground. They also address the importance of understanding workflows and workarounds in order to implement effective change. The authors of that piece, Dr. Zen and Radwani and Alder Milston, noted that it's not uncommon for an investigation into workflow changes to be done as an afterthought when the desired objective of the IT change is not achieved. Again, highlighting the need for partnerships that provide value to all stakeholders. Finally, we need to optimize patient engagement in the generation of their own data, raising the question, how do we facilitate that capture more efficiently? And we shouldn't underestimate the role of technological improvements, such as the role of artificial intelligence in EHRs. You know, the series of articles in the annals and other publications reflect that broad interest in improving the data ecosystem in order to answer questions across clinical care and research. As noted in the introduction to that supplement I mentioned, one of the critical research and reporting needs that they identified was transparency and even open source initiatives. So we would understand what electronic tools have been constructed, how they've been constructed. This goal is certainly challenging in an ecosystem in which there are many commercial interests, but perhaps we can find a shared purpose in transparency and increased value. So in the interest of further dialogue and transparency, I welcome our experts who have agreed to share their experience innovating in the space. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed experts on how they propose to move the data ecosystem forward for all of our patients. Thank you. Great, thanks Jacqueline. And uh, thanks really for joining me in setting the stage for this workshop. And, for framing so clearly the imperative to establish a high quality real world data ecosystem. Um, before we hear from our panels of experts who will be talking today about the current state of real world data capture at the point of care, and then also some of the initiatives that address some of the real challenges with capturing those data at scale, I wanna to touch briefly on an initial set of, of considerations to align stakeholders around the ecosystem. Now, Jacqueline, you, you highlighted some of what I'll suggest in, in your remarks, and I'm sure that we'll come back to these considerations throughout the workshop. Um, in fact, I expect that we'll also refine them over the next two days so that we have really an improved and shared understanding of what will really be needed for this ecosystem to function well. 
So first I'll, I'll suggest that scaling and sustaining this real world data ecosystem depends first on ensuring that the ecosystem creates value for a diverse set of stakeholders. Now, at the center of the ecosystem are those patients who want effective therapies and the clinicians and providers who are engaging with them, who want to engage with them and not with a computer, as Jacqueline, you highlighted nicely. Um, those clinicians do face an ever-increasing, really often poorly coordinated coordinated set of requirements that they have to meet in order to deliver and then receive payment for patient care. So keeping that issue of clinician burnout front and center and making sure that the system, the ecosystem minimizes administrative burdens or data collection burdens will be really important. Um, research participants are critical in this ecosystem as well and for them they have long experienced what i would describe as kind of a one-way flow of data and information and are really increasingly looking to derive value from their contributions to the research enterprise now that certainly comes in the form of effective therapies and improved treatments but also information right, return of results back, back to them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an academic and I would be remiss if I didn't call out um, researchers and our academic institutions. Now, we've seen what I would describe as really remarkable collaboration, cooperation, sharing, and even speed throughout the SARS-CoV-2 public health crisis, but I, those are not attributes that we commonly use to describe the academic research ecosystem. And making sure that we as a community um, embrace some of, these, uh, some of these steps forward that we've made, again, towards sharing, cooperation, and collaboration will be really important for this, this ecosystem to succeed. And then, you know, I, I should note also the delivery systems that value efficient delivery of quality care and as payers accelerate that move toward value-based care, those delivery systems desperately need to understand what's happening outside of the health system. So all of this is to say that when we think about this ecosystem, there are so many stakeholders and there are real opportunities for value creation for all of them that align with what it is that we're trying to achieve. But we have to keep those, those needs and that value creation for many stakeholders front and center as, as we build and refine this. You know, I'll also note that scaling and sustaining this ecosystem depends on the trustworthiness of the output that the ecosystem produces. And, you know, here, the SARS-CoV-2 health crisis has really brought into sharp focus how critically important that trustworthiness is. Um, consider the Surgisphere scandal um, in which a purported real-world data set was, was said to include almost 100,000 detailed patient records from hundreds of hospitals around the world. Papers were published before the alarm bells began to, began to ring. And I, I hope I'm wrong, but I expect that we'll see some additional, what I would call real world data headwind um, from that scandal. And we need to be cognizant of that and make sure that we're, we're attending to the value and the trustworthiness. And, and what does trustworthiness look like? Um, I would say it looks like transparency, right? throughout the process from data generation to transformation, curation, who has access to data, how those data are analyzed, and real transparency about potential for biases and conflicts of interest. Um, trustworthiness also looks a lot like reproducibility, right? So researchers, investigators, should be able to duplicate results of a study using the same source base materials that were used by the, by the original <clears throat> investigators. 
So again, I expect that these considerations um, about how we align stakeholders, keeping value and trustworthiness front and center will weave really throughout our two days together. Um, and so with that, I would like to turn us to our first session. Um, now, during our first session, we'll focus on the, the existing state of data infrastructure and clinical workflows at the point of care. Um, we're going to focus on a few real-world data sources, such as clinical data from EHRs and laboratory information systems, as well as person-generated health data. We'll hear about key trends and identify some of the challenges that impact um, data capture. Our speakers on this panel include Zach Hedinger, Director of Cognitive Informatics at the National Center for Human Factors in Healthcare, MedStar Health. Richard Moldwin, Lead Physician Informaticist of Cancer Protocols and Data Standards for the College of American Pathologists. Andy Coravas, co-founder and CEO of Electra Labs, and Ernesto Ramirez, design lead in the research, analytics, and learning team for Evidation Health. Now, just as a reminder, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please send that to the Duke Margolis email address, which is margolisevents, all one word, at duke.edu. We'll be addressing audience questions at the end of our moderated discussion. So Zach, let's start with you. You've been working to optimize the use of EHRs to really improve real world data capture. What are, what are your thoughts on the current state of clinical data? Are they being captured well? And where are there opportunities to improve? Great, thank you uh, so much for that introduction. And I'm gonna assume that you all can hear me because I hear smiling and not, you know, great, excellent. So um, so there certainly is a wide range of, of where we're seeing um, the quality of the data that's collected. And it certainly depends on the, the context of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. For context, our Human Factors Research Center uh, takes a multidisciplinary approach to try and uh, understand kind of this interface between the humans and uh, the health IT systems in, in large part and the frontline users, those are the electronic health record, but certainly it can apply to medical devices. Uh, certainly we're seeing a lot of third party applications and smartphones that are helping with that data collection piece. And um, I wanna kind of use a couple of clinical examples. Um, I'm a practicing emergency medicine physician. I work one or two days a week in the emergency department. And that's really helped inform some of the, the challenges that we've seen uh, as we try to understand that front end, frontline user interface and how that impacts the data. So about 10 years ago, uh, using a, an EHR that was uh, in operation, uh, we were seeing challenges with diagnosing patients. And, and at times, uh, clinicians would go through to discharge a patient from the emergency department based on um, whatever their symptoms were and uh, the workup, and then select their discharge from a pre-populated list of kind of some of the most common discharge diagnoses. And then they would move on to give them instructions. And we found that if you use the scroll wheel, if you accidentally hit the scroll wheel, uh, that it potentially could change that diagnosis that was on a drop down list uh, behind the scenes on another tab. Uh, and so patients were getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, when they came in for chest pain because B was above C on the drop down list. Um, and most of the time that was getting caught, uh, but certainly there, there were probably instances where it was sneaking through. And so now, fast forward 10 years later, uh, and we're in the middle of the, the coronavirus epidemic, and we're starting to see some similar challenges with how we diagnose patients and the way that the interface plays a role uh, in that diagnosis. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about some of the experiences that, that we've um, uh, anecdotally been hearing about. Uh, again, for me as a frontline clinician in the emergency department, there's a lot of uncertainty when the coronavirus patient comes in to the emergency department. Uh, they might present with some classic symptoms like fever and cough and shortness of breath, but there are other instances where they might come in as altered mental status and uh, maybe they're septic or um, maybe they have dementia baseline and really can't give us uh, an adequate history um, or they're particularly sick and just can't talk. Uh, and what we'll find is um, that uncertainty uh, then starts to manifest itself when we finally kind of decide what's going on with the patient, whether they're discharged home or admitted to the hospital when we go to put in that diagnosis. And so in the specific EHR that we use, 
Um, I can search on um, kind of free text if I'm thinking fever, if I'm thinking coronavirus or COVID, uh, those all link out to specific ICD-10 codes. Uh, but for the front end user, the system that we have in place is there to make it as easy as possible. So if I'm thinking coronavirus, I'm gonna type that in. If I'm COVID is in front of my mind, that leads to the right codes. And in uh, collaboration with uh, IBM and the FDA on the BEST initiative, we started looking at some of the diagnoses that were in place. Um, and some preliminary work that we found was that those search terms actually lead to specific ICD-10 uh, codes. Um, and so if I'm gonna diagnose someone with uh, COVID-19, um, that leads to the correct UO7.1 uh, uh, 2019 novel coronavirus acute respiratory disease that um, many people are very familiar with. But what we found was that if I was going to diagnose someone with a suspected infection, and then we know in this current state where sometimes uh, testing supplies are limited, uh, we might choose if someone's very low risk not to test them for coronavirus for COVID-19, and we might discharge them home with uh, uh, isolation precautions and following CDC guidelines. Uh, if I were to choose a suspected infection, that was actually linking out to a different ICD-10 code, R68.89, which uh, basically translate to, translates to other general symptoms and signs, which is a, a really general broad category. So for um, months, uh, a number of clinicians were just using that, thinking that they were diagnosing patients with suspected coronavirus when really it was getting linked out to this other diagnosis. And you know, I certainly understand the reasonings uh, behind why those mappings were made. Um, but you're, when you retrospectively look back at our data set or, or many data sets that we're using these mappings, you're going to see these, all these patients that we had really high suspicions or we didn't have the testing uh, and, and they're going to get a, a other general diagnosis instead of someone that's suspected for coronavirus. There's also other placeholders that we have um, when we diagnose patients for suspected, possible, probable. Um, and if we're not looking at those types of qualifiers and we're just looking at ICD-10 codes, uh, we might be missing some of that uncertainty, that diagnostic uncertainty that uh, isn't always clear when we're just looking at specific ICD-10 codes. So just to use that example, um, that understanding the, the way that the user interface um, and the cognitive processes of clinicians, just in this very, very narrow example, um, how those impact uh, the, the diagnoses and the data sets that we're looking at downstream have huge, massive impact. As we think about some of these larger data sets that were mentioned earlier, where they might be using the ICD-10 ICD code to pull in uh, individuals, there might be this huge population of suspected or highly likely infections uh, that we're missing out on. And so um, with that example, just want to call out the, the need for things like uh, human factors engineering techniques from computer scientists and industrial engineers, cognitive psychologists to really understand how that interface uh, plays a role in the, in the way that we're diagnosing patients, um, how we're choosing to test and when we're choosing to test, um, following up with patients, even the discharge instructions, uh, as we go to discharge patients, the user interface essentially either whether it's electronic or whether it's um, a paper form that gets um, uh, printed out for the patients, if that, that interface isn't clear, then we're going to have a hard time getting patients the, the data that they need to make informed decisions, uh, whether they should come back to the hospital or, or stay home. Um, and uh, the last piece that, that I want to touch on um, that we're, we're also kind of endeavoring into right now is uh, collaboration uh, using the, the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition uh, with MITRE and Mayo. I think there's going to be some more uh, discussion around that uh, tomorrow. I think there's some representatives from that group. Um, we've been collaborating with them to better understand um, the role of the EHR and the data that's being pulled in um, and the quality of the data around convalescent plasma um, and some of those challenges of identifying um, the status of patients and being able to qual uh, to be able to compare uh, patients across healthcare institutions, uh, whether it's within the same healthcare system or across healthcare systems, um, looking at uh, oxygen delivery levels, um, even mortality data can be very challenging to pull out um, in some of the, the real world implementations if you have, let's say, um, a data system that's uh, not as interoperable as we would like. So I just wanted to call out a couple of those things that, that we're coming across um, and happy to hand it back over to the next speakers. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, Richard, you you bring an interesting perspective to the chat or to the panel on some of the challenges associated with data standardization. Um, and pathology is clearly one of the first areas where data standards were put in place. Could we turn to you to provide some remarks now? Sure, I'd be happy to. Actually, I'd like to tell you the story of the. Uh, CAP cancer protocols, uh, CAP, by the way, uh, for those who aren't involved in laboratories is the College of American Pathologists. And 
It also is sometimes uh, called CAP. So I, I'm just going to call it CAP so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, back in the, uh, about the 1980s, um, pathologists used to issue these long descriptive flowery descriptions of, uh, you know, of cancer diagnostic uh, cases in their reports. Uh, and they were very, they're unstandardized and it was hard to pull out essential information, those kinds of things that were vital for clinical care. Uh, and uh, in the early 1980s, a couple of publications came out about the variability and the lack of uh, really important data elements or sometimes some these things were sometimes missing in the reports. And so a number of people at CAP decided to standardize the way, on, on, in paper, they decided to standardize the way that these reports should be formatted. Um, and they uh, started issuing these cancer protocols, they're called the CAP cancer protocols. Uh, and uh, starting about in the 1990s, they, became, they were updated regularly. New ones were added to cover all sorts of different kinds of cancers. In fact, there were so many of them that they had a very thick loose leaf binder that they put together and you had to update by pulling pages out, and, you know, the, it, what they did in those days. Uh, and then eventually there was a website where you could download these, um, uh, you know, uh, Word documents or PDF files in order to dictate reports on your cancer cases. And they're still, of course, in narrative format, but at least there was some in the, you know, some guideline for pathologists to start, you know, doing things in a standard way. Um, this was probably one of the very first uses of checklists in clinical medicine, even before the stuff you've heard about operating room protocols and the ER, some ER protocols and stuff, but didn't really get a lot of publicity. Um, but vendors had a hard time with it because these were Word documents and PDF documents. Uh, and how do you turn that into a computer screen in any kind of standard way? And then every time we issued updates, here's a, you know, we would drip out the updates and uh, it would be very hard for them to deal with. There's a lot of manual entry and interpretation involved, no code systems or anything. Uh, so the vendors were kind of screaming at the CAP for uh, you know, making their lives more difficult. And um, in addition to that, when it came to transmitting that information, that they stored in the, in the vendor systems, these pathology, I'm gonna call them pathology EHRs or just EHRs, uh, just to, to keep the, like sort of a level playing field with the different kinds of EHRs out there. Um, so they, uh, when it came to transmitting them, there would be a text blob, they would go to cancer registries and it was kind of like, it was the equivalent of a fax, even though it came over an HL7 interface because it had to be manually parsed, everything was, uh, had to be typed in again. Uh, if the information, you know, they had to find the information and type it in again. So sometime around 2003, uh, the CAP started applying SNOMED codes to those individual questions and answers, which we now call data elements in these paper and PDF protocols. And they said, oh, this will solve your problem. Vendors, this will solve your problem. And uh, no, it didn't solve their problem. In fact, it made their lives in many ways more difficult because although they had SNOMED codes and they were constantly swapping them out, occasionally they were missing. Uh, and when they tried to transmit them in messages, there were additional problems with uh, errors, with assigning the right codes in the right slots and these various kinds of messages they sent over to cancer registries and others. So the cancer registries, of course, also had a hard time keeping up with the changes that we were producing in these documents. They, they had to parse out the information for the pathology reports and they had their own system of dealing with the data. And this is gonna probably be familiar to most people on the call is that they had their own way of assigning you know, some sort of unique identifier to various kinds of structured data elements, you know, in, in the cancer registry system. Uh, the organization that deals with that is NACER, the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries, and they had a system which is now retired called Collaborative Stage. It was a very complex system, and we've uh, evolved more recently just in, uh, just for completeness into a new system called SSDI, which is site-specific data items, which is data elements with uh, codes attached to them. So any messages that come over from a pathology report have to, have to then be mapped to these uh, NACER specific data items. So that, um, that was an additional challenge, a lot of manual work there. And so the CDC sponsored a, a couple of uh, projects to see if they could rein in some of the chaos. Those are called the RPP projects or for reporting pathology protocols that involve putting SNOMED codes into specific slots in, in, in messages. Um, long story short, that project also kind of bombed because of the rapidly changing um, uh, snowman codes that we would have. And sometimes we'd issue updates and so forth. And it was a, a real challenge to get the, the codes correct. So in 2006, we be began what was called the, the Electronic Cancer Checklist Program or the ECC program. 
uh, and the ECC program initially started out as distributing all of these cancer protocols in an access database. It was very organized where each data element uh, had a unique identifier and there were links between the data elements and there was actually a hierarchy of da data elements in the database and the vendors could use that database, this access database file to get information out about the structure of the templates that they ha had to uh, produce. Um, if you've ever worked with access databases, you know they're a bit of a challenge uh, for some people. It's, we, had, we had to distribute a completely new database every time there was even one change in one line of one protocol. And by this time, we're talking about 65 different protocols approximately. Uh, and so uh, the access format was not, uh, uh, it was not agile enough and it was a maintenance burden for all of us. So around 2009 or so, we transitioned over to an XML format. So we have these basically text documents that are in XML, computer readable format. It was a pilot project. It was sort of like an alpha release uh, of the cancer protocols in this, this brand new XML format, which is not a standard. And we gave it to the vendors and they said, you know, basically it was the best thing since sliced bread for the vendors. And so there we were releasing this essentially alpha format XML model on how to create some tools for it uh, very quickly to be able to support the production of these XML-based uh, cancer templates. Um, the XML templates, by the way, we, we had a, what's called a transform for them so that we could turn them into web pages. And we use that like for demonstration purposes. So you could sort of drag this XML document into a, into a browser and you had, poof, you have a web page. You didn't really have any way to send the data in the web page yet, um, but um, it was a start. Uh, and so we've been growing that program since really 2009 with the first official release of those documents. Uh, and we saw that the vendors really liked that model. We had increasing vendor adoption. The templates were computer readable. They didn't have to guess about what goes on the data entry forms. All the vendors had exactly the same data elements on their data entry forms, regardless of the site, regardless of the vendor. Uh, and there were unique identifiers attached to each data element and each question and each answer in the form. They weren't standard. We had some standard codes, SNOMED codes, um, but we found that um, over time, SNOMED was unable to keep up with our rapid rate of change. We couldn't get SNOMED codes anymore. And so first, uh, our first um, submission one year was 400 something new SNOMED codes. And they just said, no way, we, we just don't have the, you know, we just can't do this anymore. It's too much work for us to maintain it. Uh, and so then for, for the next uh, bunch of years, we released them, including to the present time, we basically released them in XML format with the uni our unique identifiers on each line. Uh, they were called C keys, There's, people still call them C keys, they're just IDs um, for each line. And uh, that is actually, we're using that as the basis for interoperability across multiple systems, multiple sites, and in cancer registries and so forth by those unique identifiers. Um, uh, telescoping ahead a, a number of years, right now we're, we're re-embarking on a project to re snowman code every single uh, item uh, questions and answers in the approximately 100 uh, templates we have right now for resections and biopsies. Uh, that's a work in progress, uh, but it's a pretty high priority for us and we have some dedicated folks uh, working on it. So we hope to have that done in the next uh, year or two um, on the SNOMED side. Um, so in, um, to go back in time a little bit to, to 2013, we had this alpha version of uh, our XML format. We really wanted to work with a national standard so that Vendors wouldn't just be using it for cancer pathology, but we could use it for all sorts of uh, structured templates that would go to create interoperable technology agnostic uh, forms. And um, uh, so we, we worked with ONC to produce this new model uh, called Structured Data Capture, uh, which was uh, a much more standard uh, standards relevant version that anybody could use for pretty much any kind of uh, of data entry form representation in a technology agnostic manner. Uh, and so we've been releasing our cancer protocols in that format now for about a year and a half or two years. And the vendors have, have, have been using it well with really out, uh, without much in the way of complaints. And the vendors now include big name vendors like Epic and Cerner and middleware vendors like Intuitive and Voicebrook. And we're working with a, a, a large number of external groups, particularly in the oncology area, so that they can then take advantage of all this new uh, cancer data that's now in um, SDC, Structured Data Capture Format. Uh, and we have projects with a, you know, a large number of groups among professional societies, registries, governmental agencies, and so forth. I won't list them all for you that are, that are eager to take advantage of the pathology data. And I think I'll wind up there and we can 
I'll go into any more detail later when we get to questions. Great, thanks, thanks, Richard, and uh, really nicely illustrate the nonlinear path that many of these efforts take. Right, it it is a long it's a long path to the structured data capture work that you've done. So thanks for that. Great, great review, um, Andy. We've uh, touched on some of the key issues with EHRs and clinical data. But there are other data sources, right, including those data that are generated directly by patients. Can you share a few remarks on this really growing and important area of real world data? Yes, except that I'm muted. So it would be harder for me to do that. Hi, yes, I'm Andy. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of these different person generated data, perhaps patient, perhaps pre patient. And then Ernesto also. Um, will be a nice ending uh, to intersect all of these different ones together and he's afterwards in uh, evidation. So if you could go forward a slide. A bit about my background. So I'm the CEO of Electra Labs and we support pharma companies that are doing decentralized clinical trials, meaning that they're running trials at home. For anybody who is Silicon Valley here, there are no blockchains in these trials. Uh, so these are trials where you're collecting some sort of patient signals uh, at home instead of perhaps in the clinic. And uh, a little bit of my background, I previously served at the FDA in the digital health unit and had worked um, in healthcare uh, across a number of different finance and um, consulting orgs. And then I'm a software engineer by training and had worked uh, with Achille, which is a digital health company. So, and also um, you, if you have questions for me specifically, my DMs are open, so you're welcome to message me on Twitter, but there's also a chat here. So one of the things that we'll do is if you uh, feed questions back in, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So um, the hosts have uh, given you an email that you're able to do that so you can have some more conversation with us. Next slide. Okay, for anyone who hasn't thought about this, why would you even collect something at home? And I think right now we have to do this uh, because of COVID, but there's a lot of reasons to do this even pre-COVID. So if you go to the next one. This I uh, stole from the team at uh, Evidation Health, which you'll hear uh, from Ernesto yet uh, next. And so one of the reasons why you'd want to collect this sort of data is it's much more indicative of their lived experience. So if you think about data that you're collecting in a clinical trial, you're only collecting maybe one data point a month or maybe less than that, and you would never manage somebody's blood sugar on one reading a month. So why are we having drugs go out into the market based on maybe just one or two readings? And so you really miss the whole uh, experience that somebody is having at home. And so what we're looking at are, are there different ways to collect this sort of data? And specifically what I'll talk to you today is about sensor derived data. So as we all know, as great um, and, and at truly as important survey data is, it is often hard to get people to enter in and do survey based data. So these are more passive data collection and you'll often want to have these sorts of data um, in tandem because sometimes sensors might collect things that somebody's lived experience um, might not pick up. Next. Okay, oh, apologize for formatting, but um, I think when we converted to, to PowerPoint, it shifted. So one question I get all the time is, is anyone doing this? Is this just something that people are talking about in conferences or like are decentralized clinical trials real? And the answer is yes, and this was happening pre-COVID. So um, the Digital Medicine Society, which you're welcome to join and I can share more, it's a, it's a nonprofit created a public registry of all of the different sensors and wearables that people were submitting for primary and secondary endpoints. So these are not just exploratory um, decisions. And this was pre-COVID data. Our team at Electra also worked with a team at Harvard to look at the adoption of digital tools in clinical trials and found that it was increasing 34% year on year. So we were already on a spectrum of increasing using these tools. And then COVID just accelerated that process substantially. Next. Okay, so what our team does, uh, and this will be the last you hear about what we do at Electra, because I really want to make sure that we frame what's happening in the industry overall. But largely, we support teams that are doing these sorts of remote monitoring projects and using these sorts of connected biosensors at home. And so you'll see, I sometimes, uh, and there will be more discussion we can talk about, avoid the use of the word device, because not everything is necessarily an FDA device. I also don't always call these biomarkers because they may or may not be biomarker data. Um, and some of them might not be used for endpoints necessarily. They might inform future uh, decision making that you have in a trial. Next. Okay, so 
I'll say a couple things because I think this is really important to get context when people talk about what do they mean by a digital measure. And so if you go to the next slide, perhaps you want to measure something um, and we're working with the team at Evidation and a few others to really build out these sorts of thinking. So maybe you want to collect something that's really relevant for a patient, like can I pick up my groceries or can I walk up my flight of stairs? So that would be a meaningful aspect of health for the disease. Then what somebody often will say is like, well, I want to measure sleep or I want to measure activity. If you really think about that, those aren't real measurements. Your Fitbit, um, as you'll hear from Eric later, doesn't actually know whether or not you've slept. Um, these are concepts. And so then the next level of what you have to do is really define what that means. Is it a duration? Is it frequency? Is it intensity? And then measures are subcategories of each of those and really defining that is um, what allows you to determine whether or not the technology that you would select is analytically validated and then clinically validated and has the capabilities to collect those sorts of measures. This is very hard, by the way, going from step one to step two. Next. So then next, what you'd want to do is once you know what you want to measure, it's important to think about what are the different types of technologies that would do that. And it's important to go to the measure first rather than thinking, I just want to use an Apple Watch and figure out um, what can that measure. And so when you're comparing the different types of tech, there's a couple things that you might want to think about, which we'll have on the next slide. There's a lot more here than I can uh, talk about in a quick five minute overview. And this is a, a open source peer review paper that I'm happy to share with everyone. There's the way that you'd never ask somebody, what is the best drug or what is the best food? You would, you would say, well, what do you need the drug to do? Or what do you need from that food? It's the same with these sorts of wearable products. You would never say, what's the best heart rate monitor? Like, what do you need from that and in what population? And so when you, um, the couple of things that are really important is thinking about validation and validating sensors is very different from validating surveys. And there's a whole piece about how to do the different stages of validation. Second is most of these are connected to the internet. So anything from the internet can and likely will be hacked. And so really thinking about what are your, what's your risk profile and how are you protecting all of those? And it's a new um, channel that uh, you need to protect for your patients. And then I split out data rights and governance from security. I think about security as an attack on a system. Things like the Cambridge Analytica incident that happened at Facebook was not a security incident. Facebook did not lose any data. Um, often there are situations where you'll be set up where perhaps the data aren't being shared in the ways that you or the participants in the study are thinking about and really ensuring both from the legal side and from the technology side that those things are aligned. Usability and utility. Um, can you wear it in the shatter, shower? What's the battery life? How is the technical support? Is it easy to ingest the data or not? And then economic feasibility. That could mostly be cost, but for some of these, um, there are many different business models depending on how you're maybe working with a subscription or if you're working with different algorithm companies that are separate from the companies. So we go to the next slide. Um, the way that you can think about this is similar to drugs or food. You would never say what one's better. You might need more sugar. You might need more protein. There are ways that you might want to flex up. You might need more validation. You might need more security. And so as you go through these evaluation processes, you really need to think about what things matter in the context of what you're looking to measure. And then next slide. Okay, and then this is just a, a hill I don't particularly want to die on, but I also think is a very important one to discuss. So technically, real, uh, I wish we could do like polling, but I'm, I'm just gonna create a pause. So if I am Pfizer and I use a digital sensor like a Fitbit or a Philips product in my clinical trial, is that real world data? I'm letting you think about it. So the answer is technically, per the definition of the FDA, this is not real world data because any data that is collected as part of a clinical trial protocol would not be considered real world data. I think these data are particularly important and many people want to discuss them in context of what we're talking about today because these are data per, perhaps collected at home or alternative sources of data. But one thing, uh, and we'll probably have more discussion over this, is I do hope that the FDA really redefines what some of this mean, because um, technically data that are collected as part of a clinical trial, even if it's collected at home using these sorts of sensors, technically are not perhaps uh, real world data as, as per definition. So I'll pause there.
Great. Thank you so much, Andy. That was, that was great. And Ernesto, we just heard from Andy about some of the um, opportunities and challenges around uh, sensor-related data. Um, and, you know, we know that the tech is an important piece of that, but what, what are there other areas and considerations that we should be thinking about? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about some of the things that we uh, work on at Evidation Health and kind of how we think of the person within person generated health data. Um, just as background, I'm the design lead, which means I'm steeped in research design uh, across a variety of different studies that we, we conduct to support biopharma, healthcare systems, and a few uh, government sponsored projects across a variety of different therapeutic areas. Next slide, please. So at Evidation Health, you know, as, as I mentioned, we, we start with the person, the individual, you know, the, the person in person generate health data. And we think of our work as really being focused on the question of fit for purpose. Do, does the data that we collect or have the ability to collect that is remote, that is passive, um, objective, that can tell us about an individual's um, key aspect of health, what is actually useful? Just because things are actually collectible from an individual, just because you can ask them for their Apple health data, just because you can get their you know, Fitbit sleep, or I mean, even you can get their um, care records from their Google Fit or their Apple health uh, tools, doesn't mean you need to get them um, for each specific study. And so we, we try to think of making sure that although we can connect to a variety of different things, uh, from a remote standpoint by doing individual level consent, not everything is actually necessary. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we've been working on over the last six months is, is what we're starting to call our evidation way, which is the science of patient input and patient engagement. And really thinking through that as you develop a strategy to bring in data, per specifically, you know, I'm, I'm really working within the context of person-generated health data. So surveys, um, like, like Andy was mentioned, plus all of those uh, sensors, those remote monitoring tools, or even EHRs, anything that that individual can, can actually give people access to within the context of a study or observational trials. How do you actually bring the, that patient, that participant into the conversation? And, and we think of it through a variety of different ways. Um, really, we try to understand what is it that actually matters to an individual. So when Andy was talking about wanting to measure sleep, for instance, does sleep actually matter? Or is it something that comes directly from a clinician or a sponsor that is assumed to be important, but may not actually be important in a patient's lives? And this is something that we've continued to work on. And I think we've seen a lot of interesting guidance from the FDA um, around making sure that measures, um, specifically endpoints, are, are actually matter to patients and that people are doing the work to connect the endpoints and the the outcomes that you're trying to assess directly to what's important in patient lives. Uh, next slide, please. One of the ways that we do it, so uh, Evidation, um, while we support a variety of these different studies, these different trials um, from our, our different partners, one of the things that we also do is engage with our own research and we use a, a really um, novel tool called Achievement, which is our consumer app, almost 4 million individuals are, are actively engaged in achievement. And what we ask them to do is actually connect their devices. So they connect their Fitbits, connect their Apple Health, their Garmin's, um, they, they take surveys, they, they engage with us in a variety of different ways. But each one of those engagements is actually individually consented. So rather than having a framework where we just, um, continue to ask people, you know, give us your data. We're just going to do some stuff on the back end. Don't worry about it. We're good people. We actually are very proactive. And it's something that, that we feel very sure is, is making sure that when an individual who has become a, basically a trusted partner with us, a trusted member of our system, that they know exactly how their data is being used and for what purposes. One of the things that we're also working on that, that was mentioned earlier um, during the introduction to, to today's uh, meeting was return of results and how to do that actually effectively so that you're not just, hey, here's a paper, I hope you can go read it, um, but actually talking about 
what is actually available to an individual and why for these different types of uh, studies. Next slide, please. So uh, I can, I'll give a brief um, kind of case study here that we, we've used in a variety of different areas. Um, uh, last year, we, we published a, a brief paper at the KDD conference uh, based on of our collaboration with Eli Lilly and Apple, where we uh, use a variety of consumer level tools in order to assess whether or not um, person generated health data uh, at scale, collected at scale, could be useful for characterizing and um, detecting uh, differences among individuals with different uh, cognitive abilities. And so we, we had about 100, a little over 100 individuals across um, normal cognitive abilities, uh, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease using uh, an Apple iPhone, an Apple Watch, a bed at sleep sensor, which, which Apple supports, and an iPad in a variety of different ways. And we were collecting uh, longitudinal data on those individuals. Um, a lot of passively collected data, but also active tasks like doing some cognition testing, uh, doing some voice recording and some, some typing tests as well. And what we're able to build is this really large scale data set at, and our, our first kind of initial tries of this is showing that these, these type of data are important and they, A, they, they can be collected at scale and they're useful for this particular use case study. We can, we're starting to see that the different ways you can analyze this data and different features you can pull from it are useful for characterizing people's cognitive abilities and where they slot in in that kind of healthy control MCI or, or AD standpoint. Um, one of the things that I'll pause here and, and talk briefly about is the role of individuals and making sure that the engagement that you have with a patient or a participant in a trial or an observational study or even just kind of a, a health program is focused on their experience. One thing that, that Zach pointed out earlier um, in his conversation around the design of EHRs I think is, is actually very valid and is sometimes overlooked when thinking about person-generated health data and that is the user experience. We think of using these consumer tools as being easy, you know, oh, you know, five million people have Apple Watches, everyone can use them. Or, you know, my grandma has an iPhone, she can use those things, it's, it's not a big deal. But when you're trying to collect robust data that has a high integrity that you can trust, um, especially when it, from a regulatory decision making process, one of the key components is making sure that you understand the full data flows and how a patient actually experiences those data collection in process. Um, I give a brief example. We're, we're currently doing some evaluation on study design for, for a particular therapeutic area, and we're trying to collect some, some novel sensor data from people's smartphones. Um, this is gonna be a BYOD approach, and what we're seeing is that the data types that we're trying to collect can have a, a really profound impact on battery life. And that piece is actually going to be integral to how we design that study, not only to tell those individuals how they should be using their tools, how they should be using their smartphone, but how we're gonna be able to ingest that data and make sense of it after it's collected. Next slide. Um, so I'll briefly uh, finish up here. Um, in a past uh, public meeting uh, that Duke Margola supported, you know, we at Evidation brought up kind of five key considerations when thinking about data quality from person-generated health data. And I think they, they are still really important. And I wanted to just kind of reiterate them here to close up um, my part of the session, which is, um, the key thing that a lot of people sort of hit on when dealing with PGHD is the role of missing data, data that doesn't make sense, and how to keep people doing um, actively engaged with collecting that data. From a missing data standpoint, um, I know that it's sort of tricky, it's hard to really understand what's going on, but the biggest thing that uh, individuals can do when focused on this type of data is to really understand the full pipeline of data flows. How does a Fitbit connect to an Android phone or an iPhone, then connect to a server, then connect through an API, and, and what data frequency can you expect it to come in, and what are the issues around that full data pipeline? Understanding that is really important. Also from a missing data perspective, that type of data can be actually informative and be useful. Missing data is, is data in its uh, own right. And we've actually found that 
in some other previous research that missing data is actually predictive of certain key aspects of health. Um, also, understand kind of your data analytical processes to deal with outliers that are just going to happen. Not all sensors, no matter how robust they, they are, no matter how clean a nutrition label they have for Andy's model, um, they are going to have issues. People will wear them differently. People will have some kind of you know, weird thing where their heart rate shows up as 250 beats per minute. It, how do you deal with that? Having a plan to deal with that kind of data is, is key. Um, the other piece on the other side is we have the capabilities to collect just an amazing amount of information from individuals, high frequency accelerometer data, second by second level um, heart rate data from a consumer wearable device. Just because you can collect that frequency and level of data doesn't mean it's actually needed for the endpoints that you're interested in. And this goes back to something what Andy was talking about, which is making sure that those concepts of interest are actually clearly defined. What is it around the frequency duration or intensity of a value that you actually really care about? And the last piece um, is something that I, I think is, is really just one of the neatest pieces of moving towards a world in which PGHD is not only valuable but useful is that the way that it is structured and the way that it's accessible is actually a key component into keeping people engaged. And that's because the data is actually available in real time. No longer should we have to wait until after a clinical trial closes to, to realize, oh, 90% of people weren't able to actually keep with the protocol. Or there's 50% of people have you know, four weeks of missing data in an eight week trial. Because these systems are set up to deliver and allow access to data in real time in, in you know, very frequent streams, you can use that information to actually keep people engaged. And that's some, one of the things that we are constantly thinking about at Evidation, which is how to involve individuals in the actual data collection process so it's important to them, it's meaningful to them, and they have a clear picture of what it is they're expected of and what it is that they're actually doing. Uh, next slide. I believe that's my, my end, so I will stop there. And uh, yeah, look forward to a small conversation here. Good, thanks. Thanks, Ernesto. Thanks, everyone, for your remarks. So um, actually, I'd like to begin our discussion by going back to the quiz that Andy gave us. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have a chance to answer it, but I'd like to tee that up as a, as a question maybe for some discussion and invite um, maybe Andy for you to restate it and Jacqueline for you to, to comment as well. And Andy, you might want to unmute I'm, yourself. I'm muted. There but, you go. So the quiz is, if you look at how real world data are defined and you look at the statute, technically data that are part of a clinical trial are not considered real world data. It's a, it's a definition that is defined by what it is not. So if you're using a sensor at home, it technically is not real world data per the FDA definition. That said, I think this definition is quite limiting and it's quite confusing for people. And I think there's room for a broader definition. Um, so I think the question is really, in any sort of discussion, where do you scope it? Is it scoped per FDA regulatory definition? And even the FDA kind of skirts around this because the definition I find to be quite limiting. Jacqueline, um, thoughts about that? Sure, so I think it, you're right. It says we use the word traditional trial. So we make a distinction between what might be the traditional trial, and we actually have a whole section in our framework to talk about what that traditional trial is. For example, we talk about RCTs that are more pragmatic or use real world data as being real world evidence. So, you know, we did have to, you know, make a distinction uh, because we recognize that real world evidence can be through clinical trials, but we do talk about not all clinical trials are what we would determine to be traditional clinical trials. and we. In particular, on real-world data, if you look at the framework, we talked about uh, that real-world data include patient-generated data from in-home setting and data collected from other sources that can inform. So, you know, I think, you know, we can have a debate about when you cross the line between sort of creating a device just for the clinical trial that's more traditional than versus not. Um, but I think it's open to being real-world evidence. I would also say, in the end, the question is, why do we even care about real world evidence, right? We care about it because we think it's better to gather more data from more people and, and data outside of healthcare systems and, and efficiency from data that's already captured. So I think, you know, whether we think it's, rather than debating whether it's in or out on, on whether it's traditional or not, I think the more important thing is what is the value and the information that it's giving to us. Yeah. 
great. Um, Zach and, and Richard, I'd actually like to come back to you. And, and this actually builds on maybe some comments that Ernesto made. Um, really, he touched on some, I would say, facilitators of, of capturing high quality data. And I'm wondering, in your experience, what have you seen as being kind of key limitations that prevent or have prevented the capture of high quality, high quality data? Um, and if you prefer to, to answer in the more positive frame and talk about what those facilitators have been, that's fine too, but I'd love for us to understand that a little bit better. Um, I can, Go yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab. Um, I think one, one thing that's been interesting is that uh, coronavirus kind of pandemic evolved so rapidly um, that it took a little while, a little while for people to start coming up with a standard response in terms of EHR. Um, you know, what are we going to, um, how are we going to screen patients? What are the specific um, features? First, it was travel history. Then later, it was symptom, symptoms that we were looking for. And so the process was rapidly evolving at the same time that the kind of larger vendors or larger healthcare systems were also trying to, you know, gather evidence to implement these types of tools uh, into the, the EHR. So one example that we did was we, we kind of jumped out in front uh, within our healthcare system and started developing our own screening tools um, and uh, capturing evidence on the, the front end um, and understanding workflow considerations and cognitive approaches around decision making. So if a patient comes in, you know, do I think they meet criteria for testing? If they do meet criteria, do we have the testing available to, to do that test? Um, or uh, do we maybe decide to discharge them again without that, that prior example, without testing them? And we're actually able to capture that decision making process and Early on in the stages, when we had to consult uh, epidemiologists and State Department of Health, we were actually able to capture that as well. So that was really helpful in those early phases to understand what were the workflow considerations and how were clinicians making those decisions. Um, and that was our own individual approach. And then later approaches, that I think that kind of got filtered out a little bit as we went towards a more standardized approach to screening and using tools that might have been uh, developed uh, in other institutions or by the vendors themselves. So. Um, that, that was a, a real challenge as we try to kind of pull this all together while the, the goal line kept on moving uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Yeah, the, those clinical workflows, right? They're, they're, they're key to all of this. Richard, um, what, what would you add? Or, uh... Well, uh, I guess I usually div uh, divide the problems we have with you know, general implementation and getting people to do the right thing in terms of uh, data capture and data transmission. Uh, into uh, two basic groups, uh, users and vendors, but then there's also the recipients of the data. And so I, I should um, pr probably uh, make sure that I cover all of these. Uh, so users in particular, of course, we worry about users saying that they're entering too much data or the data elements that we provide are not the, not the best ones that I can do better on my own and I'm gonna use my own. Um, uh, so, you know, that's a problem. Uh, the use of scribes, of course, in clinical medicine, not so much in pathology, uh, is a help there in order to get things into a standard format. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some improvements over time with people adopting really, you know, best practices in, in terms of templates for, uh, for data entry on the user side. On the vendor side, we have um, mostly, um, uh, first of all, there's, you know, there's always an attitude of what's in it for me, and that's understandable. Everybody wants to make sure that when they spend money on something that it's not going to go to waste, it's going to be used and it's, uh, for a good purpose, and maybe they can charge for it. Uh, the other is uh, technology mismatch, uh, mismatch impedance. Uh, the technology that we uh, prefer them to use is, is difficult for them. I think we've made a lot of strides in that area, and it, it's not nearly as difficult as it used to be, but there's still challenges there. And on the data receiver side, um, you know, in the... Um, uh, in the COVID-19 era uh, in pathology, of course, everybody knows about the problems with testing. Uh, we were you know, sort of, you know, jumping all over this initially, and it was really hard to get, you know, it's like herding cats, uh, trying to get people to adopt some kind of standard technology when every State Department of Public Health, the CDC, the World Health Organization, other international groups, everybody wants to do things in a different way, and everybody's data capture form looks different. Uh, so what we did is we actually um, produced some pilot forms for COVID-19 COVID and we shared them with the various groups, including those that I just mentioned, you know, like 
uh, but they can't they can't handle it. They can't process that kind of information. They want, you know, spreadsheets, faxes, and emails. Uh, and that's a huge challenge for us. So even if we created the world's best data elements, of course, they think that they're, everybody thinks theirs are the world's best data elements. You know, how do you, um, you know, how do you get people to adopt something that everybody uses as standard? And, and then, you know, we can go and solve some very big problems that we have. Right. So the biggest problem is just two words, social engineering, you know, that's the biggest challenge, how to get people to do things, you know, for the greater public good. Uh, well, it's, it's good to, it's good to end this session with just a small challenge, right, which is that of social engineering. So I want to I want to thank all of you, uh, Richard, Zach, um, Andy, and Ernesto, for really great presentations. I think we're now scheduled for about a ten minute break, so we'll pause and then resume promptly at two twenty. So again, thanks to our panelists. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, in our first session, we laid out the current state of data collection and talked about some of the issues that may affect the capture of high quality data at the, at the point of care. In this session, we're going to focus on some emerging examples of initiatives that are underway and really kind of aimed at tackling these complex challenges. Um, some of the early work is focused on the oncology space. So we have a few presentations that will really highlight where progress is being made. Um, first, we'll hear from Monica Bertinoli, who is the Richard E. Wilson Professor of Surgery in the field of surgical oncology at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then from Laura Esserman, who is the Director of the Breast Cancer Center at the University of California, San Francisco. After their remarks, we'll turn to our distinguished panelists who will build upon their presentations um, further. And here we'll hear from Eric Praxelis, a Rubenstein Fellow at Duke University, um, Teresa Zayas Caban, who is the Chief Scientist at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, and Peter Margolis, who is the co director of the James M. Anderson Center for Health Systems Excellent at Cincinnati. Children's Hospital. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in, as we did during the last session, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please send those to us over our event email address, which is Margolis Events, one word, at duke.edu. And we'll take questions as time permits at the end of that moderated discussion. So with that, I will turn to Dr. Monica Bertinoli and invite her to begin her presentation. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this really wonderful meeting. Um, next slide, please. So I, our group, I represent researchers from the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology, and we are clinical trialists. We're not real world data experts. And what we seek to do is to improve the conduct, increase the efficiency, and really most important, expand the scope of what clinical trials are able to do. How, how do we do clinical trials data management today? Well, everyone knows it is not through the electronic health record, but ultimately we have to capture clinical data. It has to be data that is entirely relevant to the patients that we are treating, the way we do it now is by study specific case report forms that are very strictly structured that are completed by clinical site research personnel taking data from the clinical record, reformatting it according to a very defined clinical protocol, and then it's generally collected through a proprietary electronic data management system for shipping off to the Alliance Statistics and Data Center or whatever large um, um, data repository is used by the clinical trials group. What would we like to do? We'd like to skip that step and instead take data defined by clinical protocols directly from the electronic health record and send it direct, send it to our data management center. And in this, we have created something in Alliance that we call our data innovation lab. And this data innovation lab is a focus of a larger effort known as the Integrating 
clinical trials and real world endpoints initiative that is designed to try to make this bridge to bring clinical trials level data directly out of the electronic health record into our data systems in response to clinical protocols. Next slide. So what's the real reason this would bring additional value to us? Well, obviously, you know, it eliminates a step. It eliminates the expense and challenge of having a proprietary data system, but obviously it comes with a lot of challenges. Why would we try to take this extraordinary step of really trying to get high quality data out of the EHR? Well, this is a study design that illustrates why this would be so important to us. Let's just say we had 100 patients with metastatic colon cancer who come into any of our treating centers. Maybe eight or 10 would meet eligibility for a clinical trial, consent to clinical trial population, and be the clinical trials population that's on the top. But there are going to be another 85 patients who have the same disease, the same condition, who don't end up on the clinical trial. We see this day in and day out in our clinics. What, what happens to these patients? They may or may not meet the trial eligibility criteria, but they may consent to contributing their data to clinical research. And they become a contemporary observational cohort treated in the same clinics by the same doctors, um, that can sit side by side with a clinical trials population for which you can imagine all kinds of really fascinating and important questions, research questions that could be addressed if we do it in this prospective contemporary fashion. And then finally, obviously there will always be patients who do not wish to participate in research. Our experience is this tends to be a small minority of people who come to our clinics. And then finally on the, on the, on the analysis end, you can see that there are, there are a number of different really important studies that can be done based on collecting both a clinical trials and an observational cohort using the same data system. Next slide. So what are the advantages of using the EHR to conduct clinical research, even clinical trials? Single data input system, maximizes efficiency, reduced costs, and eliminates all these errors we have with double entry, not to mention all the data monitoring we have to do to make sure that what ended up in the, electri in the electronic a proprietary system was exactly the same as what was in the, the patient's clinical record. We eliminate that. The second I've already described, I think is incredibly valuable, can place study results in the context of a contemporary, and now we're calling this the real world data, by collecting data both on protocol eligible and non-protocol eligible or non-protocol um, um, accepting patient populations. It provides a mechanism for longitudinal follow-up of study participants. You can imagine if we have a streamlined EHR system of gathering high quality data, then even after the end of, the, uh, of certain aspects of the study that may be looking at progression-free survival or some other uh, more intermediate endpoint, we could continue to gather really essential elements such as overall survival. This is particularly important for some of the diseases that we treat in oncology, where patients may have second and third and fourth line therapies all in a row, and we have no ability to examine a very rich data set longitudinally for an individual patient. And then finally, this is obviously the topic of this, this very important meeting, but it is a, I think, a byproduct of us being able to achieve this is that if the methods we developed to do clinical research within the EHR could be user-friendly and streamlined enough, they could greatly improve the quality and utility of real-world data. And we can use the clinical trials world as a testing environment for these new EHR data standards that would allow us to benchmark them to a clinical trials endpoint instead of, instead of anything else. Next slide. So the challenges are obvious, everyone knows. EHR data is heterogeneous, it has a lack of interoperability. One of the most important things is we have to build new endpoints if we're going to gather them through the electronic health record. We don't have great ways of getting, at least in oncology, out of 
EHR data today out meaningful outcome data. And what, I, what do I mean specifically? Is the treatment working or not? It's very difficult, even with, even with high levels of curation to understand that accurately. And how is, and obviously um, symptoms, side effects, adverse events, very difficult to capture. And then finally, right now, there's a significant exist, existing clinician burden that we all have to live under. Next slide. So to, to one of the areas to tackle this, first and foremost, has been data standards. There is no way, I don't, I don't believe we can make any progress without uniformly applied data standards that allow for sharing, aggregation, and really eliminate the silos that we've had in our world. The first go at this, it at least based on FHIR, uh, HL7 FHIR-based standards for oncology is MCODE. The purpose of this is to develop and maintain standard computable data formats that will achieve interoperability and enable progress across the spectrum, clinical care quality initiatives, research, and healthcare policy development. And MCODE is now, version 1.0 has now been released for testing. And this iCare data initiative that I'm describing to you today is one of the earliest use cases testing the ability of MCODE to deliver high quality data from the, directly from the EHR. Next slide. Um, this is just a map of MCODE. Uh, those of you who are interested can go see at the source. You just go to mcodeinitiative.org and you can find any, anybody who's interested in data ontologies can see the source of it. And you can see in little, the title at the top says, how well does MCODE version 1.0 cover the data elements required to complete case report forms for Alliance clinical trials? This was our first first look. And so you can see the little boxes with the red dots around them. And we found that we did very well with MCODE version M.0 in it's the teal is cancer patients, defining the demographics of the cancer patient, cancer disease status, the one in the purple is very useful for our clinical trials, as were the primary and secondary cancer conditions. So we found a lot of data elements that we could immediately begin to import to populate our case report forms. Next slide. And this is what it looked like. We took a bunch of trials, we mapped them to MCODE, and we rolled them up with the assistance of help uh, of FHIR uh, technology help from MITRE Corporation, and we found that uh, in the blue you see variables that we can use in all of these to fill all these case report forms, including diagnosis, demographics, comorbidities, and functional status. You see in red where MCODE didn't help us as much as we needed, so we now have new data elements to propose to MCODE under development to help with those. So concomitant medications, for instance, is one where we need more, more standards within MCODE. And then outcome variables. Um, response to treatment, uh, I'll describe next, a really crucial one for clinical development and clinical trials. Fortunately, MCODE version one has covered that for us, but a bunch of others that are incredibly important uh, require change in treatment, adverse events, treatment actually administered, quality of life and resource utilization still are not present in version of MCODE 1.0. I just want to remind everybody that MCODE 1.0 was intended to be just an initial very early step and that the priorities for first further expansion and development of MCODE will be based on use cases. And for example, adverse events, quality of life, all of these other things you see that are missing here are new use cases that are expected to be included in MCODE in the future. Next slide. One of the really important things that we that was absolutely essential for clinical trials, couldn't do it without, was this element of MCODE. It's called the disease status element, and it is a mechanism for tracking disease natural history and treatment response. And you can see how it works. The clinician in the box, it says clinical assessment. The clinician is asked, it's a clinical assessment. Based on the data available today, uh, by a drop down menu, what are you evaluating? A primary tumor or metastatic tumor? What do you think is happening? 
There's no evidence of disease, responding, stable. This is a drop down menu that's clicked on. And then reason value, how did you arrive at this conclusion? Was it by imaging? Was it by a physical exam? And then you see at the bottom under sample resulting structured phrase, what happens as a result of those three clicks on the part of a clinician is that a statement is placed in the clinical note of the patient under the problem that the, that the clinician is describing that describes exactly what they believe the cancer disease status to be. It's a little beyond the scope of this very brief discussion to describe how this works. Just suffice it to say that without this essential element, is the patient responding to the treatment you are giving and how have you arrived at that conclusion? Without being able to include that in the electronic health record, we were really at a, at a very, very hampered in our ability to do uh, therapeutic development research. So this is absolutely a transformative element that MCODE has provided to us. Next slide. So what are we doing now? We are using MCODE and using electronic health record data capture in Alliance clinical trials. We're getting, we're, we have it in testing in three trials right now, and we are starting to implement it from the beginning um, for complete data capture in new trials. What are the principles behind this? Again, beyond the scope of this brief discussion, but first and foremost, very low burden collection. What is the, the game changer for this has been, fortunately, EPIC, the EHR EPIC, has joined us as a partner in this. EPIC has made a commitment to implementing MCODE. MCODE is now available, uh, and this important disease status question is available today in the most recent version of, M of, of uh, EPIC, and um, it's available for our sites and for users of EPIC who are who are current in their release status. And you can see a, a website that will give you more information for EPIC users there. And then finally, working with MITRE Corporation, we have developed the software and structures that have allowed us to uh, have efficient data collection and sharing across a research network. Next slide. So this is, our, this is our vision, our dream. You know, what we would like to see is EHR-enabled research with EHR-ready study-specific report forms and ECRFs for EHR data capture. This is clinical trials research, not real-world research. But we really believe very strongly that this can be a wonderful testing environment, the knowledge that we can gain. There will be spin-offs from this that will allow us to collect data in the routine clinical care environment with a much higher quality and degree of reliability for the future, which is what we all really want to see. And I think last slide, I just want to thank my collaborators. First of all, everyone at Alliance and who is working on the eye care data initiative, um, MCODE and the whole MCODE uh, team, which has been such an incredible partnership. I invite anyone interested in this kind of of um, enterprise to uh, check out the MCODE websites. It's a very freely open and available community of practice in the FIRE community. And special thanks for the eye care data project supporters, Alliance, MITRE Corporation, EPIC, the National Cancer uh, Institute, and the Rising Tide Foundation who provides our funding. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Monica. Um, let's go next to Dr. Laura Esserman uh, for her remarks. Uh, great. Thank you uh, so much for inviting me to participate. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with uh, Monica that we need to have better tools in the clinic. And um, I actually think that Richard Moldwin said it best when he said that uh, this is a social engineering problem. And I think we need a number of experiments in this area and all of us will hopefully help us get to a better place. I, I think that while I'm very aligned on that process that Monica said, I actually come at this from a slightly different angle by saying, I think that it's time for us to re-engineer the way we practice medicine, where that the collection of data is this way so that clinical trials are a seamless uh, part of this. So I think we get at the same result that way, 
but slightly different approach, which is good because I think the more we study it, the more we do, the more we'll come together. I don't think the standards are the problem. I think it's the process and the social reengineering that's the issue. So I'm gonna talk about transforming data capture and process to integrate care and research. And let's go ahead to the next slide. So um, one of the people who I really took inspiration from when I was in business school was Andy Grove and the whole way in which the Silicon Valley uh, and the, the, the software uh, industry really transformed so much about what we do every day. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from Andy Grove is there, why do we need better systems? Because there's so many people working so hard and achieving so little. I think all clinicians can uh, resonate with that. And then I would say, uh, go ahead next, is that one of the most influential pieces uh, that, uh, you know, that, that got me really thinking differently as well was this piece in JAMA, which is called Efficiency in the Healthcare Industries. I'd recommend everyone read it. It's still really relevant today. Basically, his point was, if you want to accelerate knowledge turns, you've got to do three things. You've got to develop early endpoints that you can drive around. You have to have a series of experiments ready to go. You can't, you shouldn't start an experiment without having the next two or three or four in mind. And then that you have to have systems to facilitate uh, learning and how you connect information. I think this has led to both the one source system and the platform trials in iSpy and others that we've developed. Next slide. And so I think the fundamental problem is that electron is that the electronic medical record system has really codified old processes and old processes yield old results. This is an article from Forbes. Next slide. And I think if you think about it, before the electronic health record, what we had was individual people each putting in their note. And then if anyone wanted anything out of it, we had to then abstract information, whether it's finance, billing, research, administration. Next slide. And after the electronic record, we basically did that same thing in an electronic way. So it's much more convenient because things are in an electronic format, but you're still trying to abstract. And as Monica very elegantly showed you, that's still the process we have today. We're still, we're abstracting data. Next slide. And I think the vision process change is one where people are collaborating on putting together the right versions of information that then can be electronically accessed and that there's read and write back for all things and not just stuff going out, but stuff coming in. And it's really about a systems orientation and it isn't in that I think a lot of our systems that have been developed aren't developed with this in mind. And what we need is a layer on top to really be thinking about quality improvement. Next slide. And so I think if you think about what the purpose of clinical medicine is, you know, we should be practicing to improve, not just practicing. And that means that we have to know what we're doing and what the consequences are. As Monica said, you have to assess out, you know, the assessing outcome should not be the heroic effort of chart review nor should it be just the purview of trials, nor should it just be the purview of those who want to participate in generating trials and real world evidence. This is the way we should practice, and this is actually what we should be paid to do, and that would be transformative if we had the right systems and the layers in place, and we probably need several that compete on how to improve the way we get quality data. We shouldn't have to ask permission to evaluate outcomes. Actually, we should seek permission from the IRB if we choose not to evaluate our outcomes. And increasingly, we'll need to know about cost if we want to get to healthcare value. So clinical research, in many ways, is just a special case of clinical care. Trial summaries should be visible to clinicians, not vice versa. There shouldn't be this giant wall. And what I think we learned from trials is that there's a more disciplined process for collecting data that we should really be applying to all of our clinical care. So trials should look more like care, and care should look more like trials. And I think what we want to think about is how do we refocus a clinic on gathering the mission critical data to support decision making and create this framework to assess outcomes, then we've got an integrated care and research process. And then you have things that pay, clinicians will say, wow, I can't live without this. So how have we gone about this? Next slide. So I don't need to go into this because uh, Monica just explained this, right? We just have the uh, this, this process we have now has this very separate system of clinical care and research, and I think both uh, suffer and both are bad. So what's the solution is trying to think about these technological and process, process change that drive high quality structured data capture at the point of care that really help your clinicians. Next slide. 
So again, this is, next slide. So the, this is something that we worked on with the FDA, this idea of source data capture from the EHRs. And uh, you know, the CRFs ask for data that is often not really in the, um, that, that are not uh, in, the, in, the, in the clinic. So that there's lack of discipline on what's being asked for from in trials and lack of discipline for what's being collected. And so we went through this whole process to show how there's this big mismatch and how we actually have to re-engineer the clinical process and re-engineer the trial process and try and figure out how they can merge. We use the ice by 2 trial, which is a big neoadjuvant trial because these are the most complex cases and they cover everything up to metastatic disease and breast cancer from diagnosis on onwards. Um, and we've documented this chapter and verse and you can find this online. Um, and this is what we call one source, the idea that we're all thinking about one source that helps us with care, which also helps us with research. Next slide. And again, this is this, this slide again with the idea of people collaborating around the, the, the structured capture of information that helps them do their job, that helps them figure out, well, what uh, resources do we want to give? What what referrals do we want? You know, how do we? You know, if we're going to send people to genetic counseling or smoking cessation or whatever it might be, that, that it's it's really about facilitating your process of caring for someone. But then that is exactly the data that you need uh, for for care, for registries, for quality improvement, etc. Next slide. And again, that data should come back in. So in thinking about our technology stack, we are trying to use fire standards that allow an agnostic approach. It shouldn't be just about EPIC. It should be EPIC, Cerner, Allscripts, or whatever electronic record you have. It's the idea that you can sit atop and have something that is seamless. Next slide. And then you have to have something that allows bi-directional flow. Uh, we actually chose Open Clinica because of their uh, data model and, and skip and branch logic and their flexibility and being able to um, work with us to build out some of these new tools. Next slide. And then you need to layer on um, you know, this idea of standards. The standards should be in the background. And we worked with um, Formetics to help us do that. And I, the, the standards, real, I've sat on standards committees for 30 years. You know, it's not really a problem with the standards. The problem is that you need to make sure that they're mapped and everything integrates. And so that we could integrate with MCODE, I'm sure that that would be a very simple matter because everyone pretty much in cancer agrees mostly on the standards. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get them used. Next slide. And so then the idea is that you need data that you have in place to seamlessly flow to uh, trials with once you've got consent. And so you need that kind of workflow process that's built in. Uh, that's really the key. Next slide. And then the patient reported information has to be integrated, whether it's for clinical care or trial, whether it's sensors, whether it's patient reported outcomes, you have to have a mechanism for that and the data has to come back and forth and be usable clinically. Otherwise, we've got people answering questions and no one looking at them, which really pisses off patients. Next slide. Um, and then, of course, what you really want is metrics seamlessly uh, integrated uh, and to allow better visualization. Uh, next slide. So, and again, this idea one of the principles is enter once, use many, instead of what we usually do in, in practice, which is use enter many and maybe use once. And that there are different roles for people. They can confirm or update. Someone can start it. Everyone today still makes their own note or their same assessment. How do we do that? You have to think about that. That's about process change. View only, confirm or additional data added. And as you go forward, that's how everyone collaborating together on the best possible single set of truth that we all agree to, and then having a place that you can access it as opposed to having it buried in notes. Next slide. And you know, some of this means that you really have to do the nitty gritty of understanding what your process is. So we've done a lot of work in trying to understand what is your clinical process, where does data flow, how do patients go, how do you collapse that, how can you think about that? Next slide. And then you sort of think about what is your as is process next and next that what is your as is and to be processed and start working this out where you're thinking not just about the, what you're collecting, but how and when. So it comes in a timely fashion so that you can answer the questions when it's fresh in your mind and it's not coming from left field and that it's really usable and you can then put in all the connections to make it something that you would really rely on for clinical care 
and say, wow, this makes my life better and makes me able to write notes that are really functional and good. Next slide. And so I'm gonna just go briefly through um, some really brief examples to give you a, a flavor of how we're trying to do this. So the first are our breast surgery checklists and sort of what clinicians need for care. Next slide. So one of the problems is often that people can come in. So if you take the example of breast cancer, and this could be thoracic oncology, whatever it is, that you could have many lesions. And each time you come in, where are they? So it's documented once and it's a shared, it's something that's shared with the clinicians and the radiologist so that they know uh, it's just the first phase of the journey. But next time you come in, next time they come in, you know, oh, the red one was cancer, the other two are biopsy and they're benign and the other one's under, under surveillance or whatever it is. But everyone's looking at the same page and you're documenting where that is. And it just saves infinite amounts of time. This is something we've worked on with our radiologist. Next slide. And then the whole idea, once someone goes to the OR, that you can link the surgery to the final pathology, the pathology stage, and then continue with complications and know, again, who's having a complication, who's not, and you can track these things. Next slide. And the action taken. Okay, now I'm going to show you the ISPY2 case report forms, which is really what I think clinicians need for care are now in the case report form. So this is our next slide. This is our process. I'm not going to get into it, but this is the process we went through to harmonize all of the case report forms. And the case report form started out nice and focused on clinical care uh, when we first started with CA Integrator. And then uh, as some of those systems went away for the NCI, we then developed this new system. So we've actually uh, cut our forms in half. We've gotten rid of 75% of the data elements. We've actually focused and harmonized them with the clinic. So now we have all of this information that we're now going to start using where the primary endpoint would be entered completely as source. And uh, we are going to, our form design and testing should be done and we should have this system ready to implement at the end of August. Next slide. And this is across 22 sites. Um, the next I'm going to show you the electronic patient outcomes survey platform. <laughs> this is how we incorporate patient reported data. Next slide. So tracking patient quality of life. Um, you know, this is the idea of how do you explore how patient tumor subtypes, exposure to investigational therapies, and residual cancer burden impact quality of life and allow not just uh, efficacy to be measured, but toxicity and create something that's combined like a clinical benefit index. And so uh, this is both patient reported outcome measures from PROMISE, the standard tools from the NCI, as well as the patient um, uh, reported outcomes version of the CTCAE criteria pioneered by Ethan Bash. Next slide. So we had incorporated a, a paper-based survey, but it wasn't our primary survey, primary endpoint. So actually we really only had a 40% completion rate and it's very inefficient. And we started this a long time ago. In the clinic, we have well over 85% of patients fill this out as a routine. Next slide. But again, we haven't worked out what that whole process would be, when it would be, how it's useful, how to think about it. So that required, again, mapping the quality of life, workflow survey, all the way through the treatment regimens and the new adjuvant setting, next slide, all the way through to um, the follow-up in two year. And then it's a matter of trying to train your clinicians to make sure that's integrated into the clinic. So when they come in, it's part of the checklist so the people are doing this part of their routine of care. Next slide, just like a blood pressure. And then you have to take your workflow and turn it into business requirements. The, the promise tools, the pro CTCAE, the survey email, reminders, training in the clinic, et cetera. Next slide. So we're, uh, and I think what's also really important is you're not just collecting complications because you want to know about it for your trial. You need, if someone's got a complication, the first person to know about it should be the nurse uh, or the, or the care, primary care team. So you have to make sure that you've got that workflow integrated. So if the data you're collecting is incredibly useful, people will say, wow, I can't live without it. And this is really, you know, what all these other systems have done that have, you know, transformed other, other industries. And that's one of the reasons why we work with companies like Salesforce, because that's part of this whole concept of workflow and anticipating what you need is what drives value. Next slide. So uh, just two more very quick trial adverse events, tracking what matters to clinicians, regulators, and pharma. Next slide. And this is this, you know, the, you know, the current process for iSpy, for all the trials that Monica is talking about, is the source of truth is the oncologist's note of the patient's treatment uh, course. And I noticed this isn't 
get done, uh, Monica. And I, I think this is one of the things that is the bane of everyone's existence, you know, try, trying to figure out how to do a sign attribution, whether the AEE is rel related to study treatment. At the end of the day, what you want to do is look to see whether on a population of people, you have a bigger, uh, you, you've got a signal that it's due to the drug and not due to the standard treatment. And, um, and so this is a really complex, cumbersome process that everybody hates, and it's not getting us what we need. Um, next slide. And there's this very common toxicity criteria. Next slide. The common toxicity criteria for adverse events is very complicated. One of the, because there's many, many different ways in which you can enter data. So in fact, you can have half the number of events because people are putting in two different terms for it and it doesn't aggregate up. So we've started with uh, Hope Rugo is taking the lead in simplifying the set of allowable CTCAE terminology that can be chosen. And this notion that we can pre-populate official grade definitions to support designation, including with labs putting in the reference ranges so you can automate the normalization and the uh, com co comparison of, of lab abnormalities. But more importantly, the real way you want to start this is when someone comes in, is there an adverse event to track? Yes or no? Do you want to continue to track it every week? Yes or no? Will the patient continue on therapy? If no, why not? And if yes, what's the dose modification? Now, first of all, you know that when you go back, that's part of your summary, but you also know that and your data is linked properly in the trials to begin with. Next slide. Again, thinking about the clinical process. And the last thing is that we have taken our iSpy network and uh, repurposed it for a COVID trial that actually now has its IND, will start this week. But one of the great things is we were able to start from scratch with the system and tools and link our adverse events all the way to a visual and a write back standard, which I'll show you right now. Next slide. So by collecting, you know, and these are patients who have like 60% of patients will have all these serious adverse events and maybe 4% of patients will get complications from the drug. So you really need to be able to look at by arm comparison. Everything is directly linked so that you can generate these profiles so you can really get a signal above noise range. Now, is there a way to start getting information back in? When someone is randomized to a trial arm, can you get that back to the EHR? When they finish the summary, can you get that back in as a summary to the, to the trial? Next slide. So let me just show you, this is a, a write back scalable standard for, for write back. Um, that's a fire write back API and a standard in the EPIC EHR scalable across all sites and hopefully across all EHRs. So can you just push the little video? So here it is, you send this to the problem list. And here now you say it says go reconcile and you put this in, it comes in with the code for COVID, it's already coded, you say plus, you pull it up and there you have, you can click on it. And now here is your, and here's your standard. They're on the I've spy COVID trial. They were assigned on the 21st of June. They were assigned to the Acataban arm and they were on one day on the ventilator, et cetera, it goes in. And now that's in the problem list. So the primary care can find it, that's it. You accept it, boom, it's done. This is now a really, and we're gonna actually put this into practice hopefully in a couple of weeks in, at UCSF. And if it works, we're gonna then send it to all, all the sites. So next slide. Next slide. Um, so I, our next step is this whole idea of reconciliation of the data elements in iSpy and clinic design, redesign CRFs, complete that integration of a single sign-on and open clinic uh, from Epic, and then be able to have access to these dashboards that really give you these good visuals. So at a moment, you can find out as a clinician where people are, your staff can know, the residents can know, and everyone doesn't have their own version of truth. Next slide. As I said, the, the point here is I'm thinking that what needs to be re-engineered is the clinical care process. And if we do that and we feel that care should be about improvement and learning, then all we need for research will be a byproduct of that. And I just wanna say that this is a project, oh, we've been working on this for decades and particularly in the last five years, I wanna thank Mitra Roca in particular from the FDA and, um, and the support and encouragement of people like Jacqueline and, uh, Frank Weichold and Amy Abernathy. And I would say that, uh, that none of this, uh, Adam Asara has done an amazing job of moving this forward. Heidi Collins from our EPIC team. And um, we're very excited, you know, to be working with uh, Salesforce and Open Clinic on Formetics on this. And uh, we hope we can show it's scalable. All of these experiments are so essential. We will all 
stumble and fall, but if we can make progress together and keep sharing and keep working, uh, I think this is a solvable problem. Great, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so I'd like for us to turn now to um, three distinguished speakers we have who will provide some initial reactions to, to what we've heard. Um, Eric Praxilis, let's, let's start with you. You have a really unique perspective based on your experiences and leadership roles at FDA, industry, and now academia. What, what do you see as some promising ways to improve data quality at the time it's collected? Thank, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm going to um, start off, and I'll be very brief, with where Dr. Esselman left off. I, I do think the best way to get value here, uh, quickest, best, and um, cheapest, is to think about reimagining care um, and, and point of care and data collection there. I just got back from a couple weeks out west uh, in the state of Utah in, in rural settings trying to help get COVID data moving through. And, you know, one of the things that strikes you is that, and one of the earlier speakers talked about what it was like trying to get one case report form across COVID. We don't have that. But the, but the thing that really, really um, strikes when you, when you look at that is that no matter what people are doing, they're doing a piece of something and the handoffs are a little bit blind to them. So for example, one of the things about data, and I think is really important, is timeliness or latency of data. You know, data has an expiration date, a usefulness date on it. And when it takes a long time to get data where you need it, it's, it's a lot less useful. So if we're getting COVID data flowing um, and it takes 36 hours later for, for a uh, case to be created, and then 48 hours later for a contact tracer to capture that person, um, what we were talking about in Utah is why aren't we starting the contact tracing immediately with the people in that car that are positive, right? As, a, as an idea of, but that's a different workflow. The forms are different, and, you know, so put it in an app. So I, I do think that that, that that matters an awful lot. Um, the, the, and the patient voice in that is huge. Again, Dr. Esselman finished up. I think that the, the patient reported parts of this are somewhat formulaic, and they're somewhat divided across this this regulatory regime split that we have between clinical care and biomedical products regulation, which is something that we created. It's kind of artificial. It is what it is. Um, and the idea that what we should be doing should be, should be good enough for both, I, I think is just really, really important. Um, I'm also going to agree that I'm not, I don't think the standards are the, the thing that we're waiting for here. And it's not because standards aren't important. I think they're hugely important. I just, whenever I get asked about standards, I, I actually give the same answer. Everything that we've done at any point in time that we've done it happened with whatever standards we had at our hands that day. <laughs> you know, if we, if we had a problem to solve, whether it was the undiagnosed diseases network, going with the human phenotype ontology, or whether it was um, what we did with Transmart at the time, you know, back in 2008, whatever you have, if you have a need and if it's important, move with it it's going to get better, they're going to get better. I just, I have a problem when people are saying, we, we can't run that study until we do this, or we can't do this type of analysis until then, mainly because I don't think it's ever perfect. I think, I think medicine is, is changing really fast. I mean, I brought up um, patient reported outcomes and I brought up COVID testing um, and patient voice, right? I mean, we had an interesting thing about eight days ago when, seven people were subpoenaed in New York because they wouldn't talk to a contact tracer um, and, and reveal that information. That's really interesting about where we are in health today. When COVID testing moves from the clinic into the workplace, and we're now scattering personal health data, uh, and that data, you know, our, our employees, our employers supposed to know which of their patients have COVID, and are they supposed to adjudicate? Um, where that data goes. I mean, we're, we're kind of in, living in interesting times when we're going to have to move very quickly to keep um, unintended consequences from happening. Um, so I think you go with what you've got. I think the standards we have today are what we use. We keep developing them. I, I, I do think that's great. I think that the, um, the EHR and the case report forms, they're not going anywhere soon, but I'd like to see them both go away eventually and be replaced with something that's, that's better. Um, I also think that with respect to point of care data, we have to be thinking about benefit risk of this data. You know, I think, I think we, you know, we're a lot of what we saw in the last panel and now as things gets digitized, that's a lot of data 
And you know what a an expert cybersecurity person might say is that's a lot of surveillance. And is the benefit to the patients for all that surveillance there versus what they might be giving up? And, and how do we make sure that that's like that? So for me, point of care, even during COVID, you know, it was, it's, it was interesting that, you know, that, that, that during Ebola, we did not use samples that weren't consented. We never did. Meaning that even in an emergency with a horribly dangerous disease in really difficult settings, consent still mattered. So I, I do think that's, that's really important. And I, I think the last thing that I'll say, because I know we are running a little bit of, of time, is I love what I heard in the first two speakers about, because to me, these are ways to shrink this difference between the regulatory regimes of care and biomedical product development. I'd love to see that as a five-year goal, that, 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 that you know, the, the mindset the regulatory, the statute differences just goes away. And I, Dr. Esmer may not know it, we were at uh, Georgetown together late last year at a meeting, and she said something that I've been stealing and using all the time, and that's if data isn't good enough for research, why is it good enough for clinical care? You know, and I, I do, I, I, that's I, I stand by that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just, I look at this and I say, you know, it's to the patient, I don't think they know there's a difference, and I don't think they should have to. So I'll, I'll cut my time. Great. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Um, Tracy, you you also have a unique and uh, big picture view of these these issues. I mean, a, a key reason for capturing high quality data is to be able to share it and link it with other sources of data. Can you talk a little bit about data interoperability as part of this ecosystem? Yep, certainly. So. Um, I'm, I come today wearing two hats. I'm chief scientist at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. I'm also currently on part-time assignment to the National Institutes of Health. And as you all know, um, ONC focus over the last decade has really uh, been on getting health IT in the hands of, of clinicians. And we've been widely successful, regardless of what you may think of the systems themselves, in, in achieving that goal. Um, and with the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act, we shifted our focus to interoperability and making the data move for clinical care. And the work that we're advancing at ONC through rulemaking will be a boon for research. Um, and to Eric's point, uh, standards are not necessarily the end all be all, but they certainly help. Um, the final rule that we uh, published uh, last month actually has two requirements that I think are pretty critical to the research community. One is actually requiring a FHIR-based API, so FHIR as the standard for the application programming interface to share data about individual patients and patient populations, the latter being very important for research to be able to get data about uh, patient cohorts in bulk as appropriate, you know, with IRB approval and so on for research. But it's also important for other things like public health and adverse event reporting and uh, quality improvement and so on and so forth. In addition to that, the rule also uh, created the U.S. core uh, data for interoperability standard. It builds on previous requirements with regards to minimum data that needed to be available to be shared in standardized way from electronic health record system. And it adds a couple of new things, two of which are pretty critical to research. One of them is data provenance. Um, and, and knowing a little bit more about where the data came from and how they might have changed and so on. And the other one is demographic information, which will facilitate making linkages and establishing that, you know, this patient in this system is also this patient in this system, um, which will be pretty critical to research. Um, my division is actually focused on trying to see uh, through projects and also through coordination with NIH and SCA where the rubber meets the road in terms of these policies and technologies and trying to demonstrate, for example, the ability to easily share uh, certain data elements at the point of care and for research. Um, and we're doing that in collaboration with both uh, providers, research organizations, in some cases labs, as well as standards development organizations, which is pretty critical. At NIH, we've turned our attention to what's being done in the, in the healthcare setting. Uh, in particular, last year, we issued a notice encouraging researchers to leverage fire and research and are moving on next steps to make that a reality and easier to do. Um, and we're uh, very fortunate to collaborate closely with ONC and we'll be bringing together other federal colleagues in the near future to discuss 
relevant use cases that work across agencies and funders to be able to advance that work. And we're actually funding a couple of pilot projects, one of them looking at automating electronic data capture. Um, I'd say the critical piece, aside from interoperability, since we're talking about optimizing data capture at the point of care, I'm actually an engineer, an industrial engineer by training. So earlier, um, you and uh, Dr. Corrigan Curry were singing my tune talking about workflow and issues of human factors and, and user needs. Optimize has a very specific meaning in engineering, and, and it means you've arrived at, at an optimal solution but based on conversation in this panel and the earlier, we're talking about different users with different needs. So patients, caregivers, and clinicians, primarily also researchers and then possibly healthcare administrators and payers, and thinking through and balancing what those needs may be and also not um, increasing burden by, uh, uh, with additional capture. Um, at ONC, we've been looking at reducing burden and then we released a report in February. We're also looking at how to bring sort of the healthcare and research ecosystems closer together, looking at both data issues and infrastructure issues that we need to advance. And we released a policy and development agenda outlining what we see are our priorities in that space. Um, but also, um, since my background is in human factors engineering, I, I looked at, with a colleague, at uh, some of the work that ONC and ARC have collectively funded, and, and we published an, an agenda in that space that, that this group and this audience might find yes, useful in terms of the work that remains to be done to better integrate both sort of healthcare, health informatics, and human factors. Um, the last thing I'll add that is critically important is something that we're trying to work at at NIH is actually the engagement from the research community and some of these broader health IT and standards issues. So for example, the US uh, Core for Data Interoperability Standard will be updated on an annual basis. And there's opportunity for the research community to engage explicitly and provide input and feedback into that. There's a task force that anybody from the public can join and meets periodically. Um, and their recommendations go before ONC's Health IT Advisory Committee. And then similarly, there was mention of HL7 Fire and a lot of development projects. Um, as a research, the, as researchers, we need to engage, you know, more systematically in some of these development efforts with with the standards development organizations as well. Great, thank you, thank you, Teresa. And you know, before I turn to our last our last discussant for this section, I would encourage people to pose questions for the panel for the discussants um, again by using the the email address margolisevents at duke.edu. Um, so, uh, Peter Margolis, you're a practicing physician, and you know, I'm sure you agree that the provider has a key and sometimes burdened, often burdened role in the data capture process. I know you've been leading efforts um, to improve data collection, not only for improving care, but also for quality improvement and for research um, in large data networks, including uh, PCORnet, but also your work at, at Cincinnati Children's. Can you talk a little bit about how these initiatives help you as a provider and as a researcher? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks to everybody for being part of the panel. And uh, I just want to give a disclaimer that I am not related to the Margolis of the Duke Margolis Center, sadly. Um, so I'm a general pediatrician. Um, uh, our, our focus in our work has been uh, starting from the viewpoint of the end users and actually all the end users, patients, clinicians, researchers together. Um, we're, we've been interested in uh, the concept of the learning health system and of eliminating the barriers between clinical care improvement and research. Um, and the way that we've approached this has been from the perspective of uh, recognizing that we needed to bring together all those different stakeholder groups uh, around uh, a common aim. Uh, and to do that, we realized that we not only needed to re-engineer the way clinical care was practiced, but also re-engineer the interactions between the participants. And so we've adopted an organizational model um, that we're all familiar with in our normal lives, and that is uh, what's known as an actor-oriented network organizational model. We use these today, every day, when we use Wikipedia, TripAdvisor, Yelp, um, 
they're relatively less utilized in healthcare. They have three core components. The first component is a social network of community uh, that brings together the stakeholders. The second is the use of technology to facilitate information exchange and the creation of shared resources. And the third is a learning system that drives improvement and research and clinical decision making out of uh, real time awareness about what's taking place. Um, we currently operate about uh, 12 uh, networks focused on 12 different uh, conditions that operate in uh, 700 clinical care sites, about 250 hospitals around uh, the world. Uh, and the focus is on maximizing impact on outcomes uh, and then using, by, by aligning around outcomes, uh, capturing data, then uh, using that for uh, research. The, the key steps are to align both on an outcome that matters to clinicians and patients, uh, identify a theory of action or guidelines or uh, clinical care pathways that actually result in better outcomes, and then iteratively design and test both the changes in care and the measurement system uh, so that uh, we're sure that we're that uh, we actually are producing value for people who need to make changes uh, and once we are then scale it up so an example of this work has been uh, in uh, a network uh, focused that i lead focused on inflammatory bowel disease uh, called improve care now we started with a recognition that there was a lot of variability in the outcome that matters to families, which is being in remission, not having to have any symptoms. We engaged patients and clinicians in defining what the measure was um, and uh, figuring out how to embed uh, the data capture in, uh, in workflow, and ultimately working with EHR vendors like Epic and Cerner to actually standardize get the measures embedded in the electronic health record and then uh, connected to the work that clinicians do uh, uh, with uh, uh, letters that they write, with um, uh, uh, reports that they need, and then capture that data into uh, a registry and feed it back to clinicians for clinical care planning, for population management. As a side effect of that work, we've seen we've been able to also support uh, research, uh, both uh, pragmatic clinical trials, multiple observational trials, and currently uh, working with a number of pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, around uh, the use of uh, the data to support pediatric uh, drug indications. Um, we're, we also have observed uh, pretty uh, high levels of data quality, more than 90% of clinical critical data elements are captured on a routine basis. Um, uh, we're observing, and most importantly, we're observing improvements in outcomes. So in this particular network, we've observed a, uh, we've gone from a time in which about two thirds of, uh, in which about 60% of patients were in remission to today when about 80% of patients are in remission and in other networks, we're seeing very similar effects on outcomes. So we're able to uh, improve outcomes. That's what keeps people engaged, produce information that really matters to patients and clinicians, and then use the data for research to actually uh, drive, um, uh, to, to drive learning. Uh, the concept is once we, we talk about building a pipe, once we build the infrastructure, uh, you can pretty much put anything through it clinical care, improvement, research. It's very adaptable uh, uh, and very flexible for lots of different groups. So that's been the approach. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So let's um, maybe transition now to some Q&A time. Uh, we'll have about maybe 12 minutes or so before we'll move on to the next session. Um, again, the, the uh, email address is, is up there. I'd, I'd like to start actually with a question that's come in and, and maybe Laura, I'll ask you to comment on this first, but Peter, your remarks and Monica, you as well make me think you'll, you'll have a, something to add as, as well. So um, the, the questioner notes that, you know, there are often data elements that are collected as part of clinical trials 
that we to select for a healthy trial population, but there are other examples as well that would not be necessarily collected as part of routine care. And the reverse is true, right? Where we're collecting things for in routine care that you know are not, not useful for trials, but really it's the first example that's most relevant here. What are what are your thoughts or what processes, what approaches have you taken to really um, hone in on those data that get collected as part of a standard workflow in the in the CRF? So I, I would say that, you know, we've thought about this, you know, iSpy is a good context to think about that because we have now something for COVID, we now have something for, um, for breast cancer. And if you think about it, in, in some ways you've got the same thing. You've got a spectrum of disease and, you know, the trial itself focuses in on uh, a particular segment of patients. And you really want to know who you're excluding and who you're not. And the idea of making sure you've got a standardized way of capturing data on everyone who comes in the door gives you that kind of real world evidence background. And, you know, as Monica said, you know, then you know who's not in as a, in, in distinction to the people who you know who are in. In the COVID trial, we've really you know, because we can start without any kind of legacy system, we can start right away. Everyone who comes into an ICU, everyone who's on high flow oxygen or whatever, everyone is tracked. Every single person is tracked. We may track a little less, you know, a, a more streamlined way of tracking what's going on, but at least you know who those people are and you know a few basic things about them. And you're, you're saying what, it, it, think about a checklist. It's not everything. You don't need everything, but you really kind of need to know enough to know that you can really understand the population. And maybe on your trial patients, it's a little bit more of a deep dive and people can add that. But at the end of the day, you also wanna be able to share certain information back to the trial, right? So for example, I mean, this happens like in epilepsy studies, in our eyes by studies, that we have important data on the way we've looked at tumor volume change that's not available to people who are taking care of these patients, which is really not right, right? And you wanna be able to get that data back and there is no mechanism. And a shout out to ONC for making, you know, the idea of, you know, at least the, the read and now, you know, allowing us to make comments and thinking about how to standardize right back. There are things that both sides need to be able to see from each other and both things are important. We have a big screenings trial on, on breast cancer screening, very standard things. If somebody's on the trial, how do we get that information back in and what arm they're in, in a location that the clinicians can know about it? These are not really independent of each other. So I think you have to, and, and if you are, if, you know, everyone talks about how important it is to have everybody on a randomized trial and it, otherwise you're going to have bias, but there's plenty of bias in who goes on the trial and who doesn't go on the trial. You know, and if you, if you collect the information on everyone, you can actually ask that question who did I bias myself against by, you know, how did I bias myself by not including these patients? So I, that's why I'm saying that you can have levels of data collection. And in the clinic, there are, a, you know, I, I, this whole process of streamlining what we ask in the trials and what we ask in clinic, when we finally got down to the brass tacks of what data we really needed to take good care of someone, there are actually a few things that we need in clinic, like are there multiple lesions on both sides and what that biology is, that we don't need for the trial, but we need it for care. And maybe there's some things that we need in the trial that we don't, but at the end of the day, you focus it on the things that people need for clinic and you can always add that additional small amount. And that's a much less burden for everyone and you're giving people back that information. And then you can ask all those questions that you just posed at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, Monica, maybe I wonder if I could have you comment just as well. And how, how do we how do we get to that kind of, um, if not minimum necessary, sort of um, optimal amount of, of data to collect that's useful, right? How have you right. done? So we're, we're ultimately trying to create a learning health environment and trying to learn from the clinical environment just as we've learned from the clinical trials environment. Neither side is perfect. You know, the clinical trials environment is artificial and prescripted and very exclusionary. The, the clinical care, the routine clinical care environment is broad and messy and difficult to, 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 uh, to focus. 
and somewhere in the middle is where we want to land, you know, both sides contributing to the, to the process. So this is why I really do favor the approach of taking a look at both sides. At the world of clinical trials, are we gathering endpoints that are truly clinically meaningful? Is the data that we are gathering really relevant to the clinical situation? That's the first level of data. And if that's the case, then we ought to be gathering the same data in the clinical care environment. If it's relevant to clinical care, it's relevant on both sides. And then there will always be some specialized exploratory things that only the clinical trials world is going, willing to you know, mess around with. And then there are probably going to be some things that are purely based in the clinic that have less relevant to clinical trials. I, I think I'm really interested in what's the Venn diagram, what's the middle ground there, what do we we propose to be standardized across both, because there'll be great value in understanding that. Good, thanks. So we have another question that came in, and, and the questioner noted that Many, many of our speakers have referenced data quality and the importance of data quality, but we haven't really dug in or talked much about how that is assessed um, and how we are addressing real world data quality in the in the context of these examples. Um, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll look to you, Monica, since you chuckled when I, when I uh, stated that question, which, which may be an indication that you have, you have something you'd like to share. And then maybe Laura and, and Peter, I wonder if you'd like to talk about that as well. So, Monica? Well, I chuckled because I disagree quite vehemently with my colleagues who say the standards aren't what matters. Um, quite vehemently. And I'm not saying that there is any one standard that is perfect. But what I am saying is if we're going to have a learning health system, we've got to have a system that can share across the entire spectrum of what we're doing. And what we need to be able to do that put simply is a common language. You know, so if I say, it's it's yellow everyone knows what yellow means <laughs> it's not it's not you know lemon yellow versus light yellow it, these things matter um specifics matter and um i think one of the things that we've learned from our from a very deep dive into what kind of data come out of the electronic health record um, the most experience I have is in the Cancer Link Enterprise, is that something simple that everybody's got a standard for comes out 35 different ways in different systems, and they are not interoperable. So right there, if your standards are not interoperable, you cannot do research across an enterprise. So in my mind, I don't care what standard it is, but we've all got to use the same one. Because otherwise, we're really spinning our wheels. Oh, and I, I feel pretty passionate, and I think that is a huge driver of quality. Our and, approach and has been that we've been able, by starting, by starting with patients, what patients and clinicians need, showing them the, uh, showing them the quality of their data, transparently across sites and then using it for clinical care, the data quality improves. And so what we've been able to document and we published on this is the ability to achieve very high levels of uh, data quality, not quite at clinical trials levels, but you know, 90 percent of critical data elements, uh, complete data capture. And the reason why it matters to clinicians and patients, the reason why, and we're also not paying clinicians to collect data. They, Mm -hmm. These are data collected on 90% of, more than 90% of patients across 100 different care centers in real time in clinical care, uh, achieving very high levels of, uh, of uh, quality. So I want to just, I want to echo that, but I, I think, again, this is what the shift should be. You know, Monica is right, but you can't get it out the back end. You can't fix data quality retrospectively or off the back end, right? And Peter, the whole point right. is you've got to change people's mind, change the whole mentality, which is, wow, we should all be focusing on high quality 
data capture. Right from the get-go, that should be the underlying principle of our clinical care. And what I would like, part of what our whole re-engineering point is, imagine if your entire clinic was focused on helping you collect the right information once that people could, instead of writing their own separate note, just verify that it's true. You would actually have a single source of truth that people could depend on, use, you know, and, and the back end, you can make that all standardized so you can exchange it as Monica said, but you can't fix this problem off the back end. There has to be a sea change about how clinicians practice. I think we would all agree with that. And quite frankly, instead of yep. paying for 12 point review of systems, let's pay for what matters. Let's pay for good clinical quality data. And you people at the Duke Margola Center can help us make that happen. This is Mark <laughs> formerly head of CMS. Come on now, you know, that's like, let's get the FDA, CMS, and everyone aligned on this. This is what matters. If all we want this to come true, you pay people for it, it will change overnight. Amen to that. Yeah, we all agree. See, I, 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 what, what I would say is that the, one of the things that we found is that by building communities of physicians, very large communities, uh, a thousand physicians who are focused on using data for what matters to them, uh, they get interested in actually standardizing. And That's right. Because they're curious. We're all curious. We want to see whether we're as good as our, our right. colleagues. And oh, I want to put in a plug. I want to put in a plug really quickly. What you just said, uh, Peter, was very, was absolutely essential. And what, and it seconds what Laura is saying too. You know, I talk about ENCODE. Let me explain. ENCODE was minimal. It came out defined as the bare minimum you need to define on every cancer patient. And then the development out from there as a structure that everybody can use is a community effort. If some group got behind a, in a big room and decided, okay, here's the standard you're all gonna use, forget it, it would fail abysmally. So what MCODE is trying to do is to take all the existing standards, everything everybody is doing, convene use cases under HL7, which is the you know, mechanism. And so anybody out there with a need or a use can then plug into that so that at the end of the day, we'll all be using the same high quality data. So, so I, wanna, um, I just wanna great. say that, I just, I just wanna say one thing about feedback on performance. So like, I think we all agree that the standards shouldn't be different for each group and they can all be harmonized, whatever it is. But imagine if you go and talk to anybody running a business, imagine running a business where you have no idea what your outcomes are and you have no metrics whatsoever. You couldn't run that business. We need to be in the business of quality improvement and we don't have the tools for it. This is what all of us need to get our minds around and make that change in clinical care practice and the rest will follow. Great, thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Monica, Teresa, Peter, and Eric for what was really a, just a terrific discussion. I, I appreciate that. Um, we are now very happy to be joined by Dr. Amy Abernathy, Principal Deputy Commissioner for Food and Drugs at the FDA, who will give us some real world insight into the critical importance of data quality when there is a need for rapid evidence generation. Um, her presentation will focus on the, the really important work that's being done as part of the COVID-19 response to understand key trends with disease spread, as well as building um, the data infrastructure for monitoring the effective, uh, effectiveness of treatments and vaccines once they get to market. Um, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Terrific, thank you, Leslie. And Thanks for having me here today to talk about the Evidence Accelerator. It is a huge honor and it is incredibly timely as we think about building the real world data ecosystem and how can we learn right now within the context um, of how we're dealing with the current pandemic. Um, so, you know, within the context of COVID-19, I don't think it would be a surprise to any of us that we need data and information um, like never before. And the number of questions before us, the number of evidence challenges is just staggering. And so as a result, um, there has been an effort to try and sort through how are we going to build the real world data community um, in service of COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
Why uh, real world data? Again, for, for this audience, I, I don't think you'd be surprised. The number of tasks are, you know, huge. We need to understand natural history disease. We also need to do something different um, than we've generally been talking about at FDA in the past, and that's that we need to constantly update our understanding across time. So what is going on within the context of COVID is different in March than it is now in July. The questions that we had were different. The outcomes that we're considering within the context of our clinical trials and real-world data studies um, are continuing to evolve. And even the tasks at hand in terms of medical products to be evaluated um, are, are changing across time. And so we need not only real-world data to serve many evidence needs, but we actually need real-world data that can be analyzed in a recurring fashion to continually update our understanding. Next slide. For that reason, um, we have been advancing a real world data community that we call the Evidence Accelerator. Importantly, this is not the only real world data activity happening in the context of COVID-19. And really it sits within a larger community that's both in US as well as ex-US. What's different about the Evidence Accelerator? We started off with the core premise that there are a number of data sets out there that are historically not brought to bear for real world data needs um, at FDA and um, within uh, this community, including, for example, curated electronic health records data, information that sits in health tech companies, as well as large health systems they, that may already have data sets ready for analysis, but need to understand prioritized questions and what are some of uh, the analytic issues um, out there. And so really, the Evidence Accelerator was intended to bring these different data partners together and learn what we can learn. It is managed by Reagan Udall Foundation and Friends of Cancer Research, and FDA sits as a scientific and technical partner sitting alongside of um, the Evidence Accelerator. Next slide. So how are we doing this work? Well, first of all, we've developed a tool suite that will be similar to many other tool suites we've had in the real world data space across time. First is a prioritized list of research questions. We started off with research questions that we needed to know at FDA and then have supplemented that with other questions coming from CDC and across um, the overall community. What kinds of questions? We'll look at some examples in a minute, but for example, this is around the natural history of COVID-19. Understanding treatment patterns, helping to plan for potential drug shortages and other medical product shortages thinking about treatment impact, including safety and effectiveness. These are the kinds of research questions that we have systematically prioritized. They also said that we need to agree on some common data elements, because if we're going to do this work as a community, one way to speed up the work is to have common variables in our data sets, as well as common endpoints. But we don't all have the same data model. So at FDA, we've built a series of translation tables that translate between these common data models. So for example, translating between OMOP and CDISC, and those translation tables are also publicly available. Another part of the Evidence Accelerator is common protocols. The idea that we'll develop a master protocol. If you can go back one slide, please. Um, and within the context of the master protocols, maybe there are the slides on, go back one. Um, <laughs> Within the context of developing the master protocols, the idea is that multiple data teams can answer the same research question and can do so being able, there we go, can answer the same research question. And what we can do is look at repetition of the analysis, convergence of findings, and also because different data partners have different underlying data sets, as well as represent different time frames and different regions of the country, we can understand when there's differences in findings, what does that tell us about the data? What does that tell us about what's going on within the context of COVID-19? And we call this the parallel analysis activity. Another thing that we found also very important in building a real world data ecosystem is the need to learn about the data. We were just talking in the last panel around data quality and the ability to explore data sets and teach each other. And so we've had a, developed a series of meetings and a forum for rapid cycle feedback and learning. And many of you who've been to various Evidence Accelerator meetings know we meet now three times a week, one hour large meetings where people are ref we're reflecting on different data sets, on different findings, thinking about what does that mean for my own research and also what kind of feedback. 
And now what we've done is start to develop a series of different evidence accelerator communities focused on specific areas, such as therapeutics and diagnostics and even oncology, which allows us to drill into certain topics. Next slide. This slide um, shows you the website, which is um, at evidenceaccelerator.org. It is run, as I mentioned, by Reagan Udall Foundation in partnership with Friends of Cancer Research. Next slide. And here's an example of the prioritized research questions. Importantly, this is a learning activity. The research questions get updated frequently. Also, as we've had new areas of priority activity like oncology, we now have specific research questions that go along with those um, priority areas. Next slide. And then, as I mentioned, there's the parallel analysis project. The parallel analysis projects really give different teams the opportunity to explore their own data. Because we're doing this across multiple different data groups simultaneously, we also can understand how different types of data sets and different data capabilities bring new opportunities to the table and allows us to look for convergence. The first question that we had for our parallel analysis project was among hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, what do we understand about natural history, the use of hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin, safety and treatment impact. And this is an example, go to the next slide, this is an example of the multiple parallel analyses with different data sources. Some data sources are standalone data sources, other data sources are a compilation of multiple data sources merged and linked, but then there's a common protocol and a common set of methods and then narrative output as we look at the different resu research results. And this really gives us a chance to work with the data. One of the things that I think about when I think about a real world data ecosystem is it's critical to work with the data. One way to understand data quality and to improve it is actually to understand the data in the first place. And this parallel analysis set of activities gives us the chance to do that work and have that conversation. Next slide. I also mentioned that we have a number of meetings and forum to um, talk and convene. This is my favorite part of the Evidence Accelerator. I call it lab meeting because it's sort of like the brown bag lunch um, that you had to, in graduate school, where the idea is to bring your results and have the conversation. Usually at lab meeting, we have somewhere between one and three different presentations. The goal is quick, pithy, and be able to present new information to get each other thinking and a very, very active chat. If any of you have ever been to lab meeting, the chat is actually the best place to look because it's some of the most interesting conversations. But really importantly, in building a real world data ecosystem, it's actually building a real world data community and people knowing each other and commenting and um, uh, providing ideas. So if you go to the next slide, that was great. There we go. This is an example from the University of California where one of the things that they're doing is they're analyzing their data every single day and they actually put this on Twitter and they also shared how they were doing that work within the context of the evidence accelerator. This is five institutions in the University of California system, all data from their epic instances now put into a single data warehouse and mapped to OMOP with a new set of mappings relevant to COVID-19 and now they have a set of dashboarding activities and importantly the dashboarding activities allow you to understand the data, allow you to understand COVID-19 do what we were hearing about in the last session, where we can say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense to me, and provides the opportunity for also many different members of the community to see different ways of doing this work. And the dashboards from the University of California has been a great example of that. Next slide. And this is another example of the UC da dashboards. Um, this one's a few weeks old. I watch it every day to find out what's going on in the state of California. And, uh, and uh, I, I sort of keep an eye on uh, what's happening in the ICU some, and uh, a Toolbutin team uh, put this on Twitter each day. Next slide. As another example from our very first uh, parallel, uh, very first um, therapeutics lab meeting, uh, the VA team presented. So the VA has now brought all of their data sets in to a single common um, data warehouse, which is now being merged with the DOD. It sits um, at Oak Ridge. And this is one of the first um, studies that they did where they were looking at race and ethnicity um, among patients uh, with COVID-19 and um, presented their data, which um, is now um, undergoing publication. Next slide. 
And importantly, one of the things that we're doing in the community is constantly bringing new ways of exploring and looking at the data, new visuals and graphics, understanding what teams are doing in terms of analysis, because that helps us understand the data sets and their value. It also is a way of sharing capabilities and it's a way of getting new ideas. Next slide. And um, one of the out outcomes from the, the VA uh, study was really looking at race and ethnicity and then also having a conversation in the Evidence Accelerator community about who had data sets with important details about race and ethnicity, because as you know, that's often a missing variable. And so it allowed us to have that conversation so that we know it when we need to do studies that look at race and ethnicity in the context of COVID-19, we know which data sets to go to. Next slide. As I mentioned, now that things have got, gotten moving, we're able to drill into additional um, questions. The Oncology Center for Excellence then crowdsourced across both the internal FDA community as well as many external um, partners to say, what are some of the critical questions we need to know about the cancer patient with COVID-19 and being a cancer patient in the, COVID, in, in the context of COVID-19? And that was some, those were some example questions. In order to organize ourselves, we've now divided into work streams based on the big areas related to COVID-19 because it's hard to keep all this work moving without having some kind of organiza organizing framework. And so therapeutics, diagnostics, soon to be um, vaccines. And then we have working groups also that sit across like oncology and soon to be um, uh, basic sciences. And each week, the different groups have lab meeting and parallel analysis meetings and different ways um, of working together. And it, it, it's gotten um, uh, rich enough that every meeting now starts off with what we call the evidence accelerator GPS, which is some flavor of you are here to remind everybody which meeting we are in and what we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. And this is just a little bit about the timeline. Our first lab meeting was on April 16th. We, onco we launched the oncology work group on June 20th. Many of you probably know last Thursday, we had the output from our first uh, parallel analysis meeting at our Thursday um, meeting last week. And there's been a lot of activity that's moved very quickly, um, in, including now um, in our diagnostics evidence accelerator work stream. We now have um, a little over uh, 180 to 200 people on most of our calls. And as the last slide um, that what you'll what you'll see is that the evidence accelerator really sits in this larger community of other real world data activities, including those which already were going on at FDA before, like Sentinel and Nest and BEST and other government activities like what's happening at the NIH and PCORI. But also now we're starting to have an international conversation. How does this potentially fit in with what's happening in Canada, the UK, um, what's going on with the Gates Foundation, et cetera. And so we're really trying to make sure that we bring the tool suite and, of common data elements and common research questions and we figure out how do we work together. But going back to this critical question of how do we build a real world data ecosystem, one of the ways that we build a real world data ecosystem is we practice and we get it right as we're moving along. And so we've really tried to leverage the very difficult time of COVID-19 to figure out how can we leverage all these different data sources that are already out there to do good work together. Next slide. The last two things I wanted to talk about are about getting Getting it right. I think the Surgisphere story um, really uh, made us all catch our breath. And um, as that story um, was evolving, we really thought about what are some of the real world data priorities we're learning right now and how do we work together to get this right. Through ISPI, ISPOR, and many other places, we've had core principles of doing high quality real world data research for a long time. Importantly, though, we need to get it right with evolving and new data sources. When we're using information directly from health, electronic health records and we have the better, better and easier ability to, um, to, uh, to um, identify patients. And so for this reason, we developed a set of draft, draft principles for the evidence accelerator and doing this work in the context of COVID-19. And these are the principles we presented last week um, at the evidence accelerator meeting after having a very um, uh, fun and vibrant and energetic um, evidence accelerator meeting or, or two when we talked about some of the difficulties we needed to deal with. I call these the principles around ruthless transparency, maintaining patient privacy, maintaining a sense of urgency 
while also doing deliberate, credible work, figuring out how to share, share, share in order to cross check each other's work and also do our work quickly and all the critical elements that we need to build trust. One of the other things that we're learning in this evidence accelerator community, and I think it really translates to this conversation around real world data ecosystem, is to embrace convergence and discordance because that helps us facilitate understanding and really explore what do we understand about what the results mean, but also what does this tell us about the data under the hood? And we've spent a lot of time thinking about that and how do different data sets bring different value um, to the equation. We will be developing a number of additional tools over the next couple of months. In the last conversation, data quality was brought up. And as many of you know, I've been obsessed with this issue of documenting and understanding data quality for years. And I think that this is gonna be a, a key area of focus and feature. Last slide. And so with that, you know, I, I want to open it up for questions, but also say this is, a, this is work in action. Um, we're learning and we're learning along with you. And hopefully if any of you want to be a part of the Evidence Accelerated community, you can join us, but we're definitely learning as we go. So thank you and I open it up to questions. Great, thanks, thanks Amy for those, those remarks. And we do have just about 10 minutes now for Q&A. Um, again, I'll ask those who joined us to send questions to the event email address. Again, that is events at duke.edu right there on the screen. Um, and while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I, I love that I get to start with a few of my own. Um, so, you know, um, Amy, I have had the opportunity to join in the Evidence Accelerator and you really have the, you describe it as a community that you're building and that, that community feeling is certainly apparent, a learning community. Can you talk a little bit about some insights into real world data quality that you've, you've gotten so far and maybe even some things that have surprised you? Because I, I know that when we're moving as fast as we are in this COVID world, um, there are a lot of surprises along the way. So, so first of all, um, with, as it relates to insights, um, you know, I, I think some of them we had strong hypotheses going in, but um, you know, kind of being able to understand whether or not those hypotheses were correct. Um, you know, importantly, real world data and real world evidence is a complement to clinical trials and helps inform and hone our clinical trials activities. And we need to continue to think about how to appropriately position the role of real world data. One of my insights was that um, we need to be very careful about how we talk about these things because there will be the ready action of just running with everything that's found and, and sort of it, it being described as um, gospel from that point forward if we're not deliberate and careful about how we describe and think about things. Um, as, as I suspected, but probably more um, uh, important than I realized is the, is the criticality of triangulation. Um, really being able to look at the same question from multiple different lenses and understand consistency and findings. The parallel analysis project is kind of like that, but we're seeing this in other ways, such as um, patients' experiences and, 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 and symptoms. How is COVID-19 different than influenza-like illness and different ways of um, getting a handle on, on, on that concept? Another thing that's been critical is longitudinality. And also another thing that's been critical is understanding healthcare delivery. Um, the other surprise, um, so the surprise that I had was that we, and, and, and this is gonna be said in the negative, but it's actually meant as much in the positive. We didn't have as much muscle around working across um, transdisciplinary boundaries as I would have hoped um, we had and we need to build that. So the tech company, the tech community needs to figure out how to talk to the healthcare community, needs to talk to figure out how to talk to the biostatistical community, machine learning, all of these different pieces really needs to come together in a way that I don't think I understood how disconnected it really was. And there's the opportunity there for um, both understanding and appreciation. Yeah, that's a, it's a great, it's a great point. And I think, you know, the, the, the point that you made about embracing convergence and discordance really stuck with me. And, um, and that's so important as we think about um, how we assess, how we examine data quality. It really does 
require us to look at everything that's coming out and figure out what makes sense, how it fits together, where it doesn't, and whether it doesn't fit together because of underlying data issues or underlying population issues or some other reason you know, that, we haven't, that we haven't quite thought about. Um, really important, and that's, that's a cultural shift, right? And, and it means, you know, so first of all, doing science is messy, right? Like, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's, when you start thinking about what happens in the lab, like, there's lots of different tries, and not only do you spill things, but, you know, you sort of go down this path, and then that's working, or it doesn't, and you go down another path. Really, we're doing science together as a community, and it means that we really need to constantly cross-check, are we moving in the right direction? Is this accurate? We also need to be ready to move in a direction and then find that things are they are changing in the future. And it may be because we got it wrong before, or it may be because COVID's changing, right? And that's okay. Our understanding is changing. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly right. Um, so we are. I think we have a few more questions that may be coming in. Let me just make sure I I pull them up as I as I'm talking to you. My multitasking here. Um, so, uh, you know, one of our questioners notes um, highlights the UK recovery trial, and of course, Martin Landry was came to the evidence accelerator and presented, and that was just it was um, both breathtaking and inspiring, right? For for those of us who heard that who for that talk, and really gave a great example of how a unified healthcare system and a unified approach can really deliver transparent results quickly, right? Um, what what sort of do you did you take away from that as things that we c could move quickly to sort of push in parallel with the work that we're doing either as a community or specifically in the evidence accelerator? Well, you know, I had a lot of um, observations as Mark presenting, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was interesting because I saw him give that presentation three times in the same week, and each time I had more ahas. Um, and, you know, applicable to the United States right now, um, I, I certainly am excited and hopeful for platform trials in the United States, and I'll, I'll leave it at that because uh, certainly Laura can speak and, and others um, on this topic. I, I, I think that another sort of important aha was the importance of using real world data to fill in longitudinal follow up, um, and also the importance of real world data to really wick away the tasks of clinical trial activity from clinical practitioners so it was easy to enroll and have your patients in trials. Another sort of aha was the importance of the simplicity of the consent form and the communication and the criticality of constant transparency. You could look on their website every single day and figure out how many patients were enrolled on any given day. Um, and you know, as it relates to this community, the one of the important pieces of the recovery trial story is it was somewhat of a blunt instrument, right? So mortality, which means that there is a lot of the story to be filled in around it. And we can use all the kinds of analyses with real world data, et cetera, to start to fill in that story around, to add essentially the richness of understanding that we're going to need once we've got sort of some of the blunt findings of improved mortality with dexamethasone in place, what else do we need to learn about that and how do we fill in that story? Yeah, yeah. And you know, some of the other questions that are coming in, I think you've generated a lot of interest in the evidence accelerator, which is terrific. Um, could you just touch a little bit more on the range of data sources that you're bringing to bear? You mentioned a few of them in passing, but maybe just highlight a few of those and then um, we'll make, there's some interest in people who, people who may want to connect with that initiative. So we'll, we'll get that information out as well. Awesome. So, you know, again, we're talking about the real world data ecosystem here. COVID-19, you know, this is a clinical story right now as much as it is anything. And so electronic health record based data, data sources are critical, but many times electronic health record data sources have to be linked with other data sets, whether those are claims data sets, PROs, whether that means that you're linking in mortality data. So what we're seeing is this, many data sources that have an EHR backbone and other kinds of data, data linkages. We've got some data sources that are what I kind of consider to be large scale data sources with 
um, you know, specific but not detailed data curation. And we've got other data sources that are really highly curated um, and um, have, for example, uh, data abstraction by human abstractors with cross-checking, um, for example. So the quality controls are different by data sources. We've got some data sources that are based on in predominantly biosensors and patient um, engagement um, type activities, and that fills in another part uh, of the picture. And then other data sources that are coming um, from uh, you know, social, um, basically social sensing. So uh, there's one team that's doing a lot of work with Reddit and other places. And so, you know, again, I think one of the things that we need to do is look at the richness of information and how it all comes together. And the last thing is that, you know, there is an important role for more traditional data sources, prospective registries, prospective pragmatic clinical trials, and the pieces coming together like tapestry. Yeah, that's a great image to end with, Amy, uh, and and one that I very much that very much resonates with me. And I, I um, again applaud you for the work that you're doing to pull begin to pull the threads of this tapestry together to to really address an important and critically important um, public health emergency. So thanks for that, and we'll look forward to to watching that evolve. Um, I see that we have somehow very quickly come to the end of our of our time together that that does happen uh, doesn't it um, and you know as I've just reflected over this rich sort of three hours of time together a couple of a couple of themes um, that I'd bring forward um, you know for us to continue to delve into um, tomorrow so one we've heard from everyone really about the critical importance of partnerships in this ecosystem. So I think every one of our presenters talked about actively bringing stakeholders to the table. And that, that takes us all the way back to Jacqueline's opening remarks about the importance of the stakeholder community, and then to, to the, the comments that, that I made about the value that we have to share. And what I heard consistently is that people are bringing stakeholders to the table and how important that is for success. Um, you know, Richard highlighted that fundamentally we could boil this problem down to two words, social engineering. And, and I heard that resonated with many of our presenters as well. So the, the fundamental problem that we're, that we're working hard to solve here is not, is not a small one, rather a fairly, a fairly large one, and ties into really beginning to think about how we re-engineer that process of healthcare and re-engineer it in a way so that data are being collected that are useful not just for payment and then separately useful for other activities, but they are useful first and foremost for clinical care and then also because for clinical care they will be useful for, for research. I think a question for this uh, group to consider is, you know, how do we then move toward this high quality real world data ecosystem? How do we evolve given, given that need to really think about re-engineering some major processes? And then maybe just finally, um, you know, the, the comment and the, the, the point that Amy made about embracing both convergence and discordance and letting those truly inform um, our inform us as we develop this ecosystem. So just a, a few remarks and I will turn it now back to Marta for her closing thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie. Um, thank you, Amy, and thank you all the presenters uh, for the great discussion and for offering your thoughts here. Uh, but uh, please remember, this is not the end of the discussion. We're going to start tomorrow again, continue tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And until then, have a good evening and see you tomorrow.